Good evening. For those of you who have joined us after closed session, welcome to this hybrid regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Providing translation this evening is Estera Menkos and Claudia Lindgren. I would like to allow the translators an opportunity to explain how to use the interpreting feature on Zoom. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is your Spanish interpreter. Uh, the interpretation services will be provided in English and Spanish. Uh, once uh, the session starts, uh, at the bottom of your screen, around the middle, you will see a globe sign. You can go ahead and click and uh, choose uh, the language uh, in which uh, you would like to listen to the services. If someone speaks in Spanish, the interpreter will interpret into English uh, on the platform and vice versa. And uh, if you are accessing the meeting through uh, your telephone, you will see three dots at the top of your screen on the right-hand side. You could just click on, this, uh, on the notice that says more, and you will have the option, uh, you, will have, you will see a sign of a globe, and then click again, and then the option again for English or Spanish. Uh, thank you. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Los servicios de interpretación en español van a estar disponibles uh, de una manera simultánea. De la manera en la que pueden tener acceso a los servicios de interpretación, favor de fijarse en la parte inferior de su pantalla. En unos momentos van a ver ustedes un símbolo uh, de mundo o un globo terráqueo. Pueden hacer un clic en ese lugar y elegir el idioma. Tiene la opción de español e inglés y uh, los intérpretes van a interpretar de una manera simultánea toda la junta. Ahora, si usted tiene acceso a esta junta por medio de su teléfono, en la parte superior de su pantalla a mano derecha, Ustedes pueden ver tres puntos. Favor de hacer un clic donde diga más o more. Y otro clic ya que aparezca el símbolo de mundo o globo terráqueo. Y después les dan a elegir el idioma, uh, en este caso seleccionar el español. Muchas gracias. Estamos a sus órdenes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am Lisa Pelosi, board president, and I would like to introduce my fellow trustees, Julio Guin, Jeannie Kerr, Maria Haug, and Laura Simon, and, our, and also our student representative to the board, Ms. Macy Alvarez. I would also like to introduce, introduce our district staff, Superintendent Dr. Mary Lou Wilson, Chief Academic and Human Resources Officer, Mr. Christopher Heller, Chief Business Official, Mrs. Andrea Stubbs, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and Governing Board, Ms. Erica Madrigal, and our IT Systems Analyst, Mr. Derek Machado. Additional district and site administration uh, administrators are joining us in the audience this evening. Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Mrs. Mary Allen. St. Helena Primary School Principal, Mrs. Rebecca Rocha. St. Helena Elementary, oh, I, I don't believe, maybe not, she's not here this evening. Robert Louis Stevenson Middle School Principal, Mrs. Uh, Corinne Cox, and High School Principal, Mr. Benjamin Sinto. We are delighted and grateful that you are joining us in person on Zoom television channel 27 or on our YouTube channel. A copy of this board meeting video will also be available on our website at www.stalinaunified.org. In connection with items 4A, 4B, and 4C, the board received direction and provided staff with direction. If you would now join me in the flag salute, please. Okay, we'll move on to item 6A, which are public comments on open session items. Um, we do have six written public comments on our agenda. Trustees, have you had the opportunity to read all of those? I have, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, okay, great. Thank you. Is there anyone present who wishes to publicly comment on items not on the agenda this evening? Ms. Madrigal, any, oh, come on up to the podium, please. Good evening, Alicia Summer, 199 Knoll Place, St. Helena. Um, one item that is not on the agenda, but I think has been in conversation with the board is about the um, dissolution of the advanced placement program in the middle school. 
And as a parent whose child I found out just recently qualified for the advanced math program, yet the, it's not super clear as to what the next iteration of this is going to look like, I would just ask that we consider involving more stakeholders in more conversation about this, specifically since CDE, or California Department of Education, has not made it mandatory to implement just yet, that we consider um, having further conversation as to the benefits and the disadvantages of removing this program. Um, if we are able to provide assistance for children to help bridge the gap, who are maybe perhaps underperforming or whatever other more equitable language that uh, could signify, I, I think it would be a disservice to our students to not provide opportunities for those who display the ability and the willingness to stretch themselves past perhaps what's provided for them. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anybody else who'd like to come up and have public comment, please do so. <laughs> that was perfect, sorry. Uh, I'm Sean Mora. I am a St. Helena district resident. Um, in the March 10th board meeting, you were given a presentation by the math task force recommending eliminating the current approach of advanced math for St. Helena schools. Since that time, I've spent a lot of time researching and learning and I've met with the high school math department chair, two district staff, and next week I have a meeting with the RLS math teachers. Sorry. Uh, after each meeting, I've left with more understanding of the problem uh, and also a growing list of concerns about our district's plan for math next year. From what I've learned, um, I do support the Joe Bowler growth mindset approach to math, and I love the high ceiling, low floor. I think it's phenomenal, great idea. I learned that St. Helena High has implemented this new approach for five years, and RLS has adopted it two years ago. So it's already in place, which is great. Um, I think my concerns with the new framework is that, in my reading, it's been sparsely adopted and fiercely debated. Um, and I also want to say that I don't agree that students should skip sixth grade math. So I do think our current implementation is not the right one, but I don't actually think that's accelerated math. Um, accelerated math is where you move kids at a faster pace. So where my kids were in school in Florida, accelerated math, as an example, in third grade, did a full year of third grade math and half of fourth grade. Then the next year, the second half of fourth grade and all of fifth grade. I'm just saying that there are other ways to accelerate where you're not skipping content. And I guess that's really what I want to make sure I get across is that there are other ways to accelerate or advance other than skipping. Um, I was also concerned that we're saying that we shouldn't skip sixth grade math, but in high school, we're gonna have the kids skip two full years of high school classes and combine it into one. So that kind of just didn't mesh with me. And again, I don't, haven't seen a syllabus or known the content, nor am I sure that I could understand it after all these years, frankly, but I just wanted to learn more, um, and I haven't had a chance to, because it does take me a while to digest after meeting with people and learning. Um, I also want to make sure you're aware that most of the kids who join St. Helena High from the Montessori start in math too. And with this change, our kids from RLS would be joining in math one. And I'm not sure that that's great either. Um, I do agree that a change is needed, uh, it sounds like there's really compelling data. Um, I haven't seen it, I haven't been able to because it is confidential. Um, but I do think we need to provide all kids the math rigor they're ready for at the level they need it and when they need it. And it may not be middle school, it may be at elementary, it may not be at elementary, it may not be at middle, and it may be at high school. So there al almost need to be multiple pathways for kids when they're ready. Um, we have a new superintendent and a new elementary school principal starting soon and I believe they should be part of the discussion along with the parents. So I guess my ask is that if there's a way to pause or delay uh, and the math task force has a workshop where we can drill into the problem and have all the stakeholders involved because these people are gonna be owning it going forward also. So that was it. Sorry for being late. Thanks so much. Please come on up. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Denise Henkett, and I'm also a St. Helena resident. Um, I fully agree with what Sean just uh, was mentioning, and I think if more parents knew about the plans, about the math for the RLS, they would have been here, and maybe even children. Uh, we all just didn't know and by accident stumbled upon it. Um, we chose St. Helena uh, for our daughter, who's now in fifth grade, as there were promises that this time children that would perform above average would from now on get more attention and would benefit from a system that could serve children with any levels of math as it would give them all a different path. Till this date, I have not seen any like that throughout the school year, and she and her friends spent quite some time, and to be honest, just killing time in the hallway and trying to figure out uh, next level math without any instructions themselves. This is nothing against the teachers because they have their hands full, they're busy, but that already shows that at this time already in elementary and fifth grade, uh, there should maybe be more help for the advanced kids or the kids that already mastered uh, the subject. Um, I'm actually very excited for our possible new superintendent, Mr. Aurelio, because what I read is that uh, he's someone who mentions that excellence is a priority, as is open, transparent communication, and that is really what we would love. Um, taking away any advanced or accelerated math, uh, that, that might be a better option if we can all discuss about that. Um, I think we all know why math is so important. Um, it it it's plays a crucial role in our lives, uh, in other school subjects, as science, social studies, music, and art even. Um, and it's now more how can you balance for the middle school, right, the children that are performing uh, better or are really hardworking, that can also just be it, uh, and those that are struggling or are in need of extra help. I'm very thankful that there is enough help uh, for the children who, who needs it most and that they get the extra attention, but I'm just asking to please not to let the more gifted and the hardworking students just fade away, because if they're not challenged at this time in their life, uh, they will not learn the right academic endurance that it will take to succeed later on. So the idea could still be to group those students together, uh, because small groups emphasize collaborative learning, and when you surround them with other like-minded students, they can bounce ideas, they can motivate one another, and that you don't have the problem that when the children that are hard working only have to help the children that maybe don't want to are unmotivated, and they will also lose their interest in math. Um, it is frustrated for kids to be paired with other students who haven't, oh sorry, I didn't know there was a time limit. Oh, oh sorry, okay. One last sentence, may I do say that? Um, thank you just for putting more thought into letting all kids reach the mathematical uh, potential and then looking into if they need acceleration or enrichment and how can we help and meet their needs uh, when there are already so many other demands on the teacher's time. The teachers might need some extra help over the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to come forward? Hi. Hi. Just so you know, there is a just that there is a three I'm minute. I'm gonna make it. Oh yeah, quick. no worries. I just I, want. I I'm sorry talking. that I didn't read that at the beginning. So I just wanted to let everybody know. No so. worries. Okay, I'm Leandra Blanton. Um, I don't have anything super intelligent to say. I just wanted my children's voices to be heard. I have a seventh grader um, at RLS in advanced math, and she currently holds an A grade. She said uh, without advanced math, she would get an easy A, and she likes that it challenges her and makes her think. Um, my fifth grader, Layla, is at the elementary, and she aspires to be in advanced math. I was told that she tested high average, um, and when I asked her what she liked about math at the public school versus uh, math at the Montessori, where we came from a couple years ago, she said um, she liked working on math every day at the public school, and um, versus at the Montessori, they would get a lesson, and then they would have to work on it kind of on their own independently. She said, uh, however, at the public school, sometimes it's frustrating that she has to work by herself on a packet when the rest of her classmates are getting helped by the teacher. So that's it. I hope we keep the advanced math program. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? 
for public comment? Please. Hi, I'm Brooke Casey, PO Box 224, St. Helena. Um, I have two daughters in, um, who have participated in the accelerated math program at RLS, and it's been a really positive experience for them. And I understand the concerns, and I would like to um, be a part of the conversation where it sounds like there are some issues with it, and um, I don't know what the path forward is, but I have a lot of questions, and I just um, felt compelled to say that it's been such a positive experience for them, and I hope that we can find a way to meet the needs of a range of uh, students, and um, particularly in um, as, a, as a mom of daughters, I think um, seeing you know kids who are really interested in math having space to pursue that at this level is exciting to me and I hope that we can continue finding ways to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to make a public comment? Ms. Madrigal, anything addition, um, additionally on Zoom? Or? I do have a Zoom okay, viewer great. who would like to publicly comment. Okay. Angela, please uh, unmute your mic to provide public comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, hi, I would also like to express my concern about the adoption of the new guidelines for math in our school district. Um, as a parent who has volunteered in the classroom regularly and specifically helped with math education when volunteering, I feel that I've had some opportunity to observe some of the classroom dynamics and issues that teachers face with the wide range of ability and interest levels among the students. And as a professor in a STEM field, uh, I also have some insight into the level of preparation that's needed for success at the college level and beyond. I've taken some time to learn about the changes and guidelines that are being proposed. And while I agree with the general concept and with the good intentions of the new approach, I feel that implementing this change at this point in time is a little bit premature for our school district. From what I can tell, there has not been discussion with stakeholders about the advantages and disadvantages of implementing the changes, about how the changes would be implemented, and how teachers would be prepared and supported to adopt the new math curriculum. It's also not clear to me how eliminating advanced math at the RLS right now will impact the students who would have gone into that program and how they will continue to have their needs met. I'm concerned that the lack of communication about this may result in some of those families choosing to leave the school district. I'm also concerned that teachers don't really have enough time to prepare for these changes and that they will be put in a tough position at a time when everyone is already strained due to, their due, due to the impacts of COVID. I feel that our school district should not rush to implement the new guidelines. Um, with the start of the next school year less than three months away, I don't see how we can fully evaluate, discuss, and implement the proposed changes. Um, and I think that we should take the time to go through an informed process of discussion um, where we lay out clear objectives, milestones, and metrics of success so that we can be clear that we're benefiting our student body and each individual child. We need time to carefully consider how these changes will impact all students, how the changes should be best implemented to benefit all students, and what additional resources we may need to achieve those goals. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to voice my concern this evening. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else uh, present or Zoom, Erica? No. Um, on behalf of the board, we do appreciate you taking your time to be here tonight and share your thoughts with us. Um, it is something that we do value, so thank you for coming. Um, we are going to move on now to item 7A, and uh, this is our student representative report to the board, which is her grand finale, Ms. Macy Alvarez. Hello everyone, um, this is my board report for the month of May. Okay, so um, Student Congress, which is a group I've discussed before, it's a group of leadership students and other high school students that all meet quarterly and we discuss different issues or concerns that we have as a school, um, community and culture and how we can improve upon those goals. So our final meeting will be next week and we will be meeting with Mr. Sinto and Mrs. Brazil, who is our leadership teacher. And we'll meet with the students and we will um, let them know what we did with our projects, which were um, to improve certain aspects of our school community. So um, we'll talk about how we're getting our water bottle filling station installed, how we got our new trash cans. Um, and with that, we will also discuss possible remedies within our school and our community. Um, 
individuals with um, race and social justice issues um, in the community. And tomorrow we have our Season of Shine rally, which is focused on highlighting student accomplishments. Um, so we will be highlighting student athletes, um, academic achievements, and also where all of our seniors um, are planning on going to college or working, um, any post-secondary plans. So we'll have a slideshow to highlight um, all of their accomplishments as well. And we had prom last Saturday. It was super successful. Um, we had over 200 attendees. We did it out on Rotary Field. Everyone had a great time. I think everyone was really excited to go back to a normal dance type of event after COVID had hit us um, for the past few years. So that was very wonderful. All right, so at the RLS, they also had their first school dance. Um, it had been pushed back, I believe, three different times, but they finally had it on May 6th. And in the next slide, you'll see pictures. They had a ton of fun. Um, it was a very exciting experience um, for all the middle schoolers. I don't think any of them had experienced a school dance before because of COVID. Um, and then they also had their first field trip. So Avid seventh and eighth grade um, went to Sonoma State, um, which was also very successful and enjoyable. And they also had a very wonderful track and field final. Both seventh grade girls and boys and the eighth grade girls won their small school championship. Um, let's see. So on the left um, is a picture of their school dance, and then on the right is them lined up for their track, <laughs> for their track and field finals. So, <laughs> all right. And then I went to the elementary school um, at the beginning of their ABC countdown. So I got to see both board game day and crazy hair day. Um, so they had, at the time I went there, 25 days left of school. I'm sure they're way down the alphabet now. Um, but it was really fun to see them with their crazy hair and they were playing board games um, for a fun Friday. So that was really fun to see. And the fourth graders also went on their first field trip. They went to the Bale Grist Mill and they went on a creek walk. And on that creek walk, they were also able to learn about plant tolerance to the environment, um, what kind of living conditions plants need to survive. And they had just learned about bee anatomy in one of their classes. So they also got to look at bees and kind of talk about what they knew about the bees and their anatomy. Um, so they got to make connections. And then um, I just, when I went to the elementary school, I was wearing my college sweatshirt and they were asking me if I went to college and I was talking to them about college and um, we just thought it was, me and Mrs. Pearson thought it was really exciting. They were talking about where they wanna go to school, they wanna play football in college, um, UCLA, Berkeley. Um, one of them said they'd like to go to Pitzer after I talked to them about that. So <laughs> that was super exciting. Um, it was just wonderful to see that they were looking forward to their future um, and after high school plans in fourth grade, so. <laughs> Um, so I have a couple pictures of them playing board games and then on the left we have a photo. Um, they had a contest to submit artwork for um, the, they had a contest to draw a bee um, or some type of artwork um, when they learned about their bees and that is the drawing of a third grader and it's his native please and it was made into little buttons um, and different artwork for students to take home with them. So that was super exciting as well. And then the primary school on uh, May 4th had a bike rodeo. So it was a partnership between the Napa County Bike Coalition, Officer Brown, um, who was our district SRO, and Mrs. Montelli, um, along with the St. Helena Fire Department. So students were able to bring their bikes, their scooters, tricycles, any type of bike um, to um, school. And the school provided them for students who didn't have that. Um, and they rotated through stations, learning about bike safety, um, a safety course, a read-along and game station, um, and an obstacle course, which was the favorite part of the rodeo itself. And at the end of the course, they were aw awarded a bike bicycle license. Um, so they were super excited to have, you know, their own little driver's license. <laughs> and then here I have a couple pictures of um, the students with the fire department um, and the rest of their classmates. All right, um, thank you so much. And also I'd like to thank everyone for their support along the way as Iowa School Board representative. Um, it was really enjoyable working with everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Macy. Fabulous. That was great. <laughs> Is there any public comment on this agenda item, either present or on Zoom? There's no public comment. Okay. 
Okay, well, now we move on to 7B, which is the, the bittersweet. Did uh, you want to ask the board members if they had any questions? Oh, questions. Sorry, my apologies. Questions, board members? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for your participation and then just really bringing a student voice and also your presentations are wonderful with all the pictures. So we could tell that you really take pride in what you're presenting to us and that means a lot uh, on this uh, and for trustees because that's a lot of time how we get our information if we don't have time to visit. So I appreciate all your hard work you. and good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Dr. Wilson, would you like to usher in this when we have to release one of our own to into the wild next? <laughs> I know. Pitzer, I wonder if we could contact Pitzer and make a change. Macy, it has been a delight and a pleasure working with you as the student board representative this year. Um, some of you know that Macy works very closely with me. We have monthly meetings about the agenda and other issues. She's brought forward students that we've, we've met and discussed environmental issues at the different schools. It's been such a pleasure working with you. You have the pulse on every one of our schools. You know what is happening and you bring it to the board every month and we appreciate uh, your work in that regard. You are always prepared. Your slides are ready to go on time and in place. You are articulate, you are intelligent, and you are passionate about education and about ensuring that every child in this district has the same opportunities and that barriers are not in their way. You volunteered to go to RLS and work with the leadership class at RLS because of that very notion. Again, it's been joyful working with you. Uh, and I would uh, like to offer an opportunity for the trustees to say a few words and then I'll close. Okay, great. Laura, you want to start and we'll move, work down the line. I would love to go first. Um, I like to consider Macy my table mate because we always get to sit next to each other. And being the newbie trustee, um, I really enjoyed getting to know you and always hearing little side stories about high school since it's been a long time since I was there. So I just want to say I'm so excited for you. Congratulations. You are a smart, beautiful person, and I know you're going to go far. Macy, um, we've always had um, really fantastic uh, board representatives and each one of you brings something special. I really think that um, you, you did a lot of work um, considering that you started off kind of coming out of a, a place of, well, from COVID that we really didn't know what things would look like at the beginning of the year and you did a great, great job. And so um, thank you for rising to the challenge. Thank you for being part of our fantastic alumni of student representatives. And um, we know how much work it was for you to take on this responsibility in addition to being a senior and having all the extracurricular activities that you're involved in. So we really thank you for um, giving us the time um, out of your busy schedule and uh, making the district a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Macy. I, I, I can't even follow with those words that Joshua just said <laughs> with, with <laughs> Julio's, but thank you for everything. I, I love your enthusiasm and when you, every, every month you come in and you, you're ready to go, just like um, Dr. Wilson said, and you're um, prepared and so confident and I admire you and I'm so, you're, you're, uh, you're gonna be missed. You're definitely gonna be missed. So thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Well, I already said what I was going to say, but <laughs> I do have another side story from preschool. And that's why I remember you and your family that's over there um, since preschool. So, yeah, so we've known, we, I've seen you since you were a little girl, and now you're, I mean, yeah. so again, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Macy, I think I first met you in sixth grade, right? You're a good man, Charlie Brown. Yep. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that always stuck out then that still sticks out now is, you have such a positive, smiling disposition. And I hope that continues to be the case for you. Um, I also would wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said. And one of the things that Dr. Wilson said that I noticed about you is how well-spoken you are. And when we attended the Student Congress in the library, it was very obvious of how well-spoken and organized 
and um, the leadership qualities that you possess. And I, I hope that you find a way to keep that in your next chapter as well. Maybe, you know, maybe not right away, but hopefully that'll happen in your college life. But um, it's been great from the parent perspective to see you grow up and do all that kind of stuff too. So uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you for always showing up and being here and being giving voice to the students because we truly value that as well. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Macy, will you make your way over here, please, to in front of me in the, at the dais? <laughs> As she's walking uh, to me, um, we like to leave our board, pres board representatives with a token of appreciation. And um, we like to think that um, although you're leaving us, you will always be with us. And so we, we consider this a backpack pull or a perhaps a keychain. It does have your name on one side, and the other side says, what do you think? Always a saint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, item 7C is the introduction of our new student board representative to the board. And as this is the time of transition, this is what happens as well. So Dr. Wilson, please take it from here. Yes, I'm um, very excited. Um, with pleasure, I inter we introduce to you tonight Carolyn Wagner. Trustee Simon, I am going to be asking you to talk a little bit about the interview process in just a moment, okay? And Macy, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about um, yes. your work with uh, Carolyn as well. So um, Carolyn will be joining you as a junior, and so potentially she may be with you for two years. Um, and I have already had the opportunity to meet with her a couple of times. And in those meetings, she was full of questions, full of interest, lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm about all four schools. She really sees Macy as a mentor to her. That's what I observed, and so I know that um, there will be conversations um, to come that will assist Carolyn in her work. Um, she really has a passion for governance. She's really interested in politics and governance. So, Trustee Simon, if you could describe the interview process that Carolyn participated in in order to qualify for the, for the position. Oh, absolutely. So I had the honor to meet with Carolyn and um, uh, another teacher whose name is Mrs. Please. Brazil. Mrs. Brazil, thank you very much. And we had, um, uh, we spent about, 25 minutes, half hour together, and um, Mrs. Brazil and I asked several questions, and she answered them beautifully and gave wonderful, just gave wonderful, um, really thoughtful answers that uh, helped Mrs. Brazil and I know right away that she's going to make an, an excellent um, student member of the board. And um, that was that was the process, pretty much. It was a Q and A, and she went over and beyond in her answers. And I'm really looking forward to to working with you and sitting here with you. Thank you, Trustee yes. Simon. Macy Alvarez, would you like to say a few words about Carolyn? Yes. So um, I've known Carolyn for quite a while, and um, on a personal and a leadership level, and I just think she's the perfect person to be this role. I mean, she's confident. She's academically motivated. She really cares about everyone around her. She's a great leader. Um, I mean, she just, she's the perfect student school board representative for the future, so I'm really excited for her and for you guys to get to know her and to be able to work with her. Carolyn, would you like to come to the microphone and introduce yourself to the board? Hello, I'm Carolyn Wagner, for those who don't know me. 
I'm currently a sophomore at St. Helena High School, and I truly feel very honored and excited to share the student perspective with the board. Um, I'm hoping that throughout my time I can uphold and establish a strong sense of safety, spirit, and overall inclusion of the schools in our district. So I thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'm glad to be working with all of you. Great, thank you. We do look forward to it as well. Carolyn, come back. Carolyn, come back. <laughs> Again, it's with pleasure that I bring to you uh, Carolyn Wagner as your new student board representative. And I am going to ask her to circle the dais and um, be welcomed by each of you, and then we'll have a photograph with her as well. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to item 8A now under communications board member reports and um, I'm going to ask trustee how to update us on the primary school so yes I mean we it's always difficult for those of us who are board members to follow a report on our schools after Macy's <laughs> reports but um, I do I, I really lucked out on um, and I'll, there's just a few photos that I have. I really lucked out on the day that I went. Um, there was actually uh, Officer Brown was with two um, local uh, community workers that um, that train service dogs, and they had uh, she had brought the uh, service workers along with one of their service dogs into um, the classrooms and. It was just a really magical experience to see how the kids interacted with the dogs, how um, how the uh, how the, they asked questions. Um, it was just um, and there are two classes here. It's um, Miss um, Landis's class and Miss Chia's class together with with um, the dog. And um, one of the um, and this is the segue into my next theme. Um, first of all, that we have such great community um, partnerships where we can where we can bring these um, extracurricular activities into our schools, and then second, um, there I, I I'm going to focus on one individual student um, who um, uh, uh, Principal Rocha explained to me had arrived um, uh, in the middle of the school year, basically with um no um with no english language whatsoever and he was thriving and he was participating he was using the english that he had to talk about his dog or i, I wasn't quite sure about how excited he was with the dog there but he was just to see someone who was brand new to the country to the district um, doing so well and integrating so well, it really, it really was a testament to his teachers and to this, the, the, um, the community that we that we have. And um, this was just a very happy little boy. And um, I, I just, I was, it was, it was thrilling to see. It really moved me. And um, I don't, I don't know if we actually have a picture of him, but of course that was Officer Brown. Um, one of these is him. 
Uh, <laughs> 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 anyway, but, but anyway, so um, and then uh, and then the third thing that I would like to focus on, um, I, I'm kind of trying to keep it to three um, three topics so that I don't take up too much time. Uh, on uh, yesterday, I was able to visit um, the school, the primary school again. This time with Brandon Farrell. And it was really nice to be able to walk around with um, our union representative to the classrooms um, and visit them uh, on, a, on a Wednesday, kind of mid-morning. Uh, it was lunchtime, basically, but after their lunch. And they were almost every class was involved in some sort of um, hands-on activity, whether it was kind of art or science. It was, it was really good to see that... that, that um, there was a lot of um, imagination. There was a lot of expression going on through art, through uh, there, the one project that we were visited in the library. They were reading about a dinosaur. Everyone was cutting out dinosaur patterns and coloring the dinosaur patterns. And this was at the um, kindergarten level. And up to um, we saw uh, science, um, science uh, activities being done as well as art and uh, painting activities. So it was just a really um, nice experience to see um, all, the, all the work that our primary school teachers are doing to keep our kids engaged and uh, to feel happy and I mean, just look at their faces. So anyway, and that's it. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move on to 8B, the superintendent subcommittee reports. We have three reports for this evening. We'll start with the LCAP steering committee, committee uh, trustees Haug and Kerr. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's see, the, the final LCAP um, uh, steering committee was held on April 26th. Um, it was here in the room, it was hybrid as well as in person. And the, um, we started out with the, um, um, at each, at each um, meeting, we'll have uh, one of the principals um, talk about their um, student achievement outcomes and things at their school. So it was, it's a perfect transition from the primary school. It was um, Ms. Rocha talking about um, the different strategies and activities that they have done throughout the year. Um, one of the, there's a cut, there was actually a lot, um, but one of the things, there's just a couple I wanna, um, stand out here. Um, she talked about the um, guided language acquisition um, design professional development, and it's, a GLA it's called GLAD for um, the acronym. And right now, it's um, six teachers are certified. Um, that's kind of pre-pandemic they were certified. Um, and now the um, all, and all, all the staff are um, are going through the process of being GLAD certified. Um, and it's the um, there's demonstration lessons, and then they have like in classroom. Um, um, consultants and things coming in and, and kind of helping out with that as well um, and it's um, and it's just a and I and I'm and I apologize for not explaining it very well as far as what it is and I, I do apologize for that um, but it's it's just a different way of looking at um, how, how, what it looks like in the classroom and how to um, uh, Kind of get the get the students interested in what they're what they're learning, um, and it's and it's so that's that was very interesting. And then and I know that this board is going to be very excited about the the PK program that that was also going on this in the spring. Um, my notes say 44 parents participating in that, um, and then it was um, uh, very well received by the parents. And it's the the P, it's PK and it's called the Parent Institute for Quality Education. And it was, and I'm just reading this right off the thing, there's a team of four staff members participate, and then there was uh, four ta staff members participating in a UC Davis Resource Excellence in Education, um, which is called READ, um, which uh, was a committee to work around the bilingual family partnerships. So with PK, basically in a nutshell, it just helps our, it helps our, 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 um, our Latino families coming in and feeling um, like they know how our system works and we're comfortable into our, in, in our school system. And with that, it's, um, for me, it's like this, this sec the second step um, from what our St. Helena Preschool for All does for our parents as far as their par parent education. So it just makes relationships within our community even stronger. 
Um, and then probably the last thing that I would like to say is that there was a, um, they're really, they're, they're really focused on, in on um, SEL curriculum and they, they have this year has started the um, curriculum with the rainbow kits and the, and the rainbow kits is um, something coming through the Napa County Office of Education and it's basically a love for all club to start um, to support um, all students and families um, in, our, in our school district and it's specifically um, for our LGBTQ students and families. And so that is my report for L the LCAP. Unless okay, you have anything you. you want to add. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, wellness and school climate is also Trustee Kerr and Olguin. So, mm -hmm. you can add anything that we left off. These are also hard to follow after the student presentation. <laughs> but um, so this one met on May third. Uh, we did the same thing, hybrid and in person. It was very well attended. Uh, by district staff, community organizations, and community members, which is always, it's good to have a good representation across the board. Um, they had a student wellness uh, and climate update, so I'll start out with the student update first. Uh, the student was Sophia, um, who I believe is a senior in the high school. She was, um, gave us an update on the high school wellness garden, which she said she's working with uh, Principal Sinto to install. Um, it's it's a wellness garden. Um, they basically they're putting in an irrigation system, and they had selected all the plants, and that should be done by the end of the month. And what they're trying to incorporate is um, a place for students and staff, like a quiet space, a place to relax, uh, meditate. So they're adding like a walk stone pathway, wood seating, and then a water fountain. So that's going to be great for students and for staff that want to um, get a space to really just sit and relax and think. There is also um, updates from the Blue Zone. They mentioned just some of the work that they're doing at the school sites with the gardens. Um, they mentioned the bike rodeo, again, with, in collaboration with the Napa Bike Coalition. And then they mentioned the walking bus, which was uh, from Stonebridge to the schools. And that was a, a really huge success uh, in some of the meetings. And in this one in particular, they've mentioned that the students are really excited about participating in that and, and want to continue to do that. So that's something that maybe in the future that we're going to continue doing. And then the, there's a bike to school day at RLS on May 20th is what they mentioned. And then for the social emotional learning update, uh, Mary updated the group on the work um, that's happening at the county level. Um, she talked a, lo a little bit about the rubric that they're, they're using to, to look at each um, school site. And that's kind of what she was um, discuss it just in terms of moving forward basically seeing where all where because each school site is different and using the rubric and just to see where we're at now and then just really looking for next year and in the future to have more consistency across the school sites and that's going to require um you know planning and opportunity to incorporate those um the, to integrate those skills so there's there's still things that um, the staff and you know also the community can help support with that as she mentioned the updates as well, the student surveys. Um, and really the takeaway with that is just that it's really important that our students uh, participate in that and that the data is, is utilized to make some of those changes. And so it's important to have that. And we've been doing it for, for a while now, so it's just really important for our students to be honest and give that um, feedback so that we can hopefully implement some of those changes. And then there was an LCAP update. There's gonna there's a presentation on it, but I'll just uh, mention uh, uh, Chris um, reviewed the student panel, so that's different than the sur surveys. And that was um, the the topic was around drugs and alcohol during the pandemic. So that was kind of the, the topic that they had the conversation with about. And then um, that was held with two different groups. So there was an avid group and then a leadership group. And overall, I mean, they got some interesting um, information and just uh, things that they um, learned about this uh, pan or the drugs and alcohol use during the pandemic. I think that, do you want to add anything? No, not at all. Thank you. It was great. It was just, it was, you had everything. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. And then Monrovia met this morning. That was Trustee Olguin and myself. And I'll say a few things. Um, because you just spoke, and I'll give you a break there. Um, uh, Dr. Wilson hosted her the final Monrovia meeting uh, for the school year today. There were seven of us in attendance that included um, 
Dr. Wilson, Trustee Elgin, myself, uh, Paul Doring, the Vice Mayor of the city. Um, we had Joaquin, and I apologize, I, he's from the Executive Director of Blue Zone, but I'm, what is it? Uh, Joaquin I wrote, I wrote R, and I'm sorry that I didn't write his whole name out, I apologize. And Diane Dillon also joined us th today. Um, so we just, uh, it was, a, a, oh, oh, actually, and we had a, um, uh, a special guest, Mr. Ruben Aurelio, um, also joined us uh, via Zoom. So that was exciting. He got to meet some of the, uh, of the stakeholders in that committee. Um, I think some of the big takeaways to know um, is uh, Diane Dillon talked about, um, you know the the need for understanding within the county how um, the, how the county the Napa County staffing we have a lot of vacancies in this county at the moment and therefore it's it's a challenge to deliver some services at this point and so positions are getting filled but she said it, it's been a it's been a struggle at that level to be able to deliver services that they did pre COVID time um, she also uh, talked about. Um, you know, the Napa Firewise Council, and she's doing a lot of work in there, and how the umbrella of the, the, the county seat of the Napa Firewise Council is doing a lot of great work to help bring fire safety and uh, events and information out to the other com to the rest of the community. Uh, we also heard from uh, Paul Dorain, who informed us that there was a new park and rec director um, that was on board. His name is Dave Johns. Uh, they are on the second round of interviews for a new city manager. And um, one of the great things that he shared with us today is that there were three nonprofits that are going to be awarded, that were awarded $30,000 each. And they will, they are three nonprofits that will, that did not have to apply for funding as, you know, the, for, for the work that they do to serve the community. And that was Rionda House, Up, uh, Up Valley Family Center, and the Boys and Girls Club. So that was pretty exciting. And I'll let Julio talk about Preschool for All because that's what well, he knows yeah. so well. So I'll just mention as well, the, so what Paul Doring also mentioned was the nonprofits, they, they do a grant program. And they did award uh, two, 225 for other nonprofits, and we were, were one of those, Sandland Preschool for All. So along from Rionda House, uh, Valley and Boys, there's uh, numerous other nonprofits that the city is supporting. So we're super grateful for that partnership. Um, just on my end, I mean, our, the Preschool for All just uh, continuing to work on enrollment with our families. And then um, for the summer, we're working on swim lessons in partnership with the district. So we're excited to hopefully bring those back and just basically transitioning our fa some of the families into the district and then working with new families to bring those families in. So we're excited about that work as well. And of course, the school district, we spoke about all the great things happening at the end of the year. Um, our, the Napa County celebration last night for our particular staff that was acknowledged and recognized. Dr. Wilson and Trustee Kerr, I believe, attended that. Um, you know, we just look briefly on facilities, but those are all things that you're, you're a well, well aware of. Um, and a lot of the information is also contained in our principal reports. So I don't want to be too repetitive. Yeah. And I just want to thank Dr. Wilson for inviting uh, Mr. Aurelio. He, I mean, he's obviously not going to get everything that he needs to know about St. Lena, but definitely just, it was a good opportunity for him to connect and meet a lot of the um, community partners. So I, I thought that that was a great idea. So thank you. Okay. okay, thank you everybody. Uh, now item 8C is the St. Helena Teachers Association report to the board. Mr. Brandon Farrell. Okay, I agree. Um, I actually have my report that kind of um, backfills uh, our visit yesterday at the primary school with Trustee Haug. So I wanna appreciate the invitation from Trustee Haug to visit the primary school at a great time. I'm not around little people as much as I used to be, and Sinto doesn't invite me to his house. So um, <laughs> it was interesting to be around little ankle grabbers again. So um, we began our stop in the library, which I always do when I go to the school, uh, to talk to the great Miss Montelli and Mrs. Chia, who was in the library. So um, they were, as Trustee Haug said, uh, doing a lesson about dinosaurs, cutting things out. I also noticed that they had a wall of superpowers or some wall of hands. So I don't know the actual theme of the, the thing, but one of the kids' superpowers was math, which was I think was good, um, being a former math teacher. Um, 
Then we went to Miss Chandran's class, which I've never been into before, and um, I'm always excited to learn about that. Uh, she really does a good job in, in terms of uh, collaborating with the teachers around science, and she's got all sorts of tools. I mean, they look like Legos to me and looked like fun, but you know, coming from you know when we all go, went to school in big blocks and taking naps, it's a little bit different than you know the type of learning that that we used to do in, at, at that age. So um, I really enjoyed that, and I really enjoyed talking to her about how uh, her program meshes uh, with the specials. I thought that was fun. Um, we visited Miss Torres' class, and they were uh, talking about noise and uh, banging on a can with a balloon. Uh, so there was again a science-type themed activity. It was it was really neat. Um, talked to Miss White, um, and she was in an art lesson, and I knew some of the kids in that particular um, class, and I don't think that they were going to be too shy with me, and they may have even wanted to throw some paint at me, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, it was fun to see them. Um, we didn't stay there long, uh, but it, you know, the primary school seems like a very happy place, so I was excited to see that because I haven't been there for a while now that my uh, youngest is in fifth grade, and you know we had COVID and all that, all of that stuff. Um, Miss uh, Haug and I reflected a little bit of, on t her time as president, which I appreciated, and um, I uh, certainly enjoyed seeing the t t some of the teachers I haven't seen in a while. Um, geez, uh, other than that, our teachers are some of them are ramping up to do to help out and do some summer school. I think that there's a report uh, today about summer school. Um, some of them are, are gearing up to do some professional development. Some of them are gearing up to relax. I'm gearing up to sit and bake in the sun and watch softball. So um, there's all sorts of things our teachers are going to be doing in the next few months. But I, I do hope that they rest. I do hope that they come back. And this was a, a, another difficult and interesting year. Um, I thought we've uh, once again surpassed expectations. and. Uh, um, I think our teachers deserve a lot of credit for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Um, item 8C is the uh, CSEA report to the board, and this is a written report. I'll remind the trustees. And then item 8E is the superintendent's report. Dr. Wilson, please. Yes, thank you. You know, over the course of the last number of years, this report, I would share with you a list of the numbers of activities that are happening at the end of the school year. And two years ago, I was able to report to you that we would be doing an individualized high school graduation where Mr. Sinto arranged for each senior to come into this room. And we were very excited to be able to hold that graduation for those students. And last year, I was able to announce to you that we would have a high school graduation on the um, sports field. And we also held RLS's promotion on the sports field. We were very excited to bring those activities to you. Today, I'm going to read a few more for this year. So on May 25th, we have the elementary school um, choir concert. On May 25th, we have the high school avid senior banquet and the uh, FFA, Future Farmers of America, awards banquet. On May 26th, the primary school is holding a family fun night and RLS and the high school are, are having a shared choir concert. On June 1st, parents that, are, um, that are, have students at the primary or the elementary school will be celebrating in their PK celebration or graduation, as uh, Trustee Kripp mentioned earlier. More details for you, trustees, will be coming um, so that if you are able to attend, you can. On June 2nd, uh, the county office will host the Career Technical Education Awards down at uh, Napa County, um, actually at the Copia Building. On June 8th, we have a fifth grade promotion that will occur at Crane Park, uh, and the primary school will have their choir concert. On June 9th, we have eighth grade promotion that will be at RLS in their, I call it front yard, uh, the, the place that they typically hold promotion. And on June 10th, we have our senior high school graduation, which will again be on the sports field. It was a huge success last year, and we will have a repeat in location for this year. We're very excited to have uh, this number of events and activities to culminate the school year for not only our students and our teachers, our, our employees, but for families as well, because it's part of our culture and it's part of our tradition. 
As I end my report, I would like to remind the trustees in the community that our principals write a report to you every month. Those are focused around four of the five goals. Um, they have lots of information in them, and I do encourage you to take a moment to read those reports. And I thank the principals for the work that they accomplish on a monthly ba basis to make those a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, you know, say I would echo that comment as well. Items uh, E, eight E through uh, I are the principal reports respectively for each school, and they always contain great information. So thank you, principals, as always, for providing that for us. Um, and as Trustee Cow would always remind everybody, whether you're whatever role you are in this school district, please take a moment to read those because they're great reports. Um, okay, item 9A is the cons I, I have, oh, I have oh, one sure. question. Sorry, my apologies. And I, 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 will, I will hijack um, a little bit of time just because I meant to mention it during my report, but I just want to give a shout out to the band oh, uh, right. concert from last night. It was phenomenal. Um, the band won uh, all sorts of awards at Music in the Parks. Um, and uh, they just did a fantastic job last night. And uh, thank you to all of the band parents because um, as Ms. Fulmer said, um, and so aptly put, um, they did whatever it was, Zoom band at some point <laughs> during, <laughs> during um, COVID and uh, listen to them now. They're just phenomenal, so. Thank you. Okay, item nine um, is the consent agenda. The consent agenda contains routine items judged as appropriate to be acted upon in one motion. If a board member requests that an item be removed from the consent agenda, the item will be considered under discussion slash action items. Is there anyone present who wishes to comment on this agenda item? Ms. Madrigal, any written or Zoom comments? There's no public comment. Thank you. <clears throat> Trustees, do you have any questions about this agenda item? No? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. As most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will request a roll call vote. Trustee Simon? Aye. Trustee Howe? Aye. Trustee Kerr? Aye. Trustee Vice President Olkeen? Aye. President Pelosi? Aye. Motion carried. Okay, item 10A is an update on the adoption of board policy 5145.9 and the administrative regulation 5145.9, hate motivated behavior. Dr. Wilson. Yes, thank you. At the April 21st board meeting, uh, we presented the a updated board policy for hate motivated um, behavior. And at that time, um, after much really great conversation and input from our parents, staff was directed to take that board policy and do some research and take a look at any existing or potential administrative regulations that could help support and uh, actualize the board policy for staff. Uh, remember, board members, that the board policy is the, the action that you vote on that is the overarching um, outline of the work that we do, and then the administrative regulations come to you as information, and that's really the recipe or the directions for staff how to implement a board policy. So uh, at this point, Executive Cabinet uh, and uh, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, so uh, Mary Allen, Chris Heller, and Andy Stubbs and I have done some preliminary work on an administrative regulation that will include that definition of what um, hate speech is. I'm very um, happy to, to, to include that definition. So we've done some preliminary work. The the AR, it's very critical that our principals have hands on an administrative regulation because they are the ones that are implementing the work. And so on Tuesday of next week, we have a meeting with our principals where they will review and discuss, provide any feedback and updates to that administrative regulation. Following um, that meeting, we will then take uh, the board policy uh, draft of the AR and an investigation form that I failed to mention earlier. So that's a, a template that would be used when hate motivated behavior is um, is reported that will take our principals through a step by step process as to how it's being investigated and that it would be reported to um, the chief academic 
uh, human race resources officer. So once all of that has been vetted with our principals, we'll then take it to our board policy committee. Uh, sitting on our board policy committee, two of our trustees, uh, Haug and Olguin, and then uh, again, Mr. Heller, Ms. Stubbs, Mr. Sinto, our high school principal, Mary Allen, our director of curriculum and instruction, and myself. And we will one more time take a look at the policy, the administrative regulation, and this investigation form, and the, make any changes that are recommended um, from that group. Ultimately, our goal is to bring this package for you at the June board meeting. Uh, and if, if not, we will certainly provide you with another update in June. So really good work has occurred. I appreciate the comments and suggestions from the community and the board. I think that it's um, bringing more of a, an actualized, authentic um, AR and investigation form for uh, hate-motivated behavior. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment? Please come forward. Alicia Summer, 199 Knoll Place. Um, it is, uh, I'm grateful for the board and the current superintendent's response to um, our request as stakeholders. As some of you may or may not know, the school environment subcommittee at RLS was formed in response to what felt to us as parents, an overwhelming amount of bullying, sexual harassment, racial harassment, and hate speech. And this group of almost 30 parents, excuse me, Context. Um, swiftly began to work with RLS administration to help clarify their discipline policy and implement strategies to improve the feeling of safety our students feel on campus. This discipline policy that we helped Principal Cox now in its third iteration, which I believe is helping to influence this AR for 5145.9, is currently under review with them, and um, we were told that it would be would not be passed until the actual board policy is passed. And as you continue to take the time to intentionally craft this policy that serves our students, we ask you to also consider and include the following. An annual site level report to the board. We can look to Alameda School District's bias related incident tracking system as a guide to using information gathered in Aries and elsewhere to track student behaviors. This, was, this will help us determine the efficacy of the policies that we are looking to and working so hard to implement. I also recommend that the board consider an oversight committee of parents from the school environment subcommittees that we hope to roll out to each school site to ensure that what we experience as parents and students um, is also in con is congruent with what's captured in the data and that there are no discrepancies. Perhaps this can become a function of the LCAP committee or the equity, climate, and culture committee. Lastly, I ask that as you look at this board policy for 5145.9, also look to the bullying and all harassment policies to add language similar to, I believe, a Berkeley Unified School District policy, which says that when a report of bullying is submitted, the principal or a district compliance officer shall inform the student and parent of the right to form a file, to right to file a formal written complaint in concordance with the uniform complaint procedures. If I'm uh, correct, our current bullying policies do not require uh, administration to inform parents that they have the right to file a formal complaint and what those procedures are. Thank you. Can I ask one question? Because you were speaking quickly on what. No, it's, it's okay. Time. <laughs> no, I totally understand. But you had you there was you had three things that for yes, to take yeah. into consideration. The first said annual, but I didn't hear what you said after annual. Sorry, an annual site level report. Site level. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Alameda okay. has something called the BRIT program, a bias a bias related incident tracking system. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. If there's anybody else present who'd like to make a public comment, please come forward. Uh, Sean Mora, I realized I forgot my address last time, 236 Crystal Springs Road. Um, I am also on the board for the St. Helena Public School Foundation. Uh, and in that, I am the RLS site liaison. So I found out about the uh, problems that were happening at RLS. Um, by attending those meetings. Uh, and I, I think from one of the things that I just wanted to ask, which I just heard requested, was that we have some sort of tracking. I think what concerned me when I was hearing it is that there, no one had a sense that the data had been tracked and that could be brought up to another level saying, hey, we've got a problem here, we need help. Uh, and yes, we know, we, we searched on the internet and it is true, of course. Uh, but this system does appear to be well documented. I'm, you know, I don't know, hopefully don't have to buy something new. They repurposed an existing tool in Alameda, it sounds like, that the teachers use to report things. So it would just be a different type of reporting category. But uh, I, 
let's not start from scratch, but make sure that we do have something because we don't want to just make changes and hope that they're working for the kids because you never know what type of education or conversation is going to work with each type of kid and by the different types of incidents. I guess you could have bullying, racism, so that. Um, and just to be able to look at it, is what we're doing working? Because maybe we try a different speaker next time. Maybe the book did make an impact. Let's make sure we keep doing it. So it's just not hoping that what we're doing is working and let's show that it's working. That was all. Thank you. If there's anybody else present who'd like to make a public comment, please come forward. Ms. Madrigal, any Zoom or written comment? Oh. Hi, I'm Brooke Casey, PO Box 224, St. Helena. Um, so I also wanted to speak to the hate motivated behavior policy and I'm really grateful to the board and um, to the district staff for working to expand this policy um, in an effort to respond specifically to some of the incidents at the middle school, but also hopefully to prevent um, and respond to future incidents in all the schools. Um, so as was stated, the parent uh, school climate committee has been working um, with Principal Cox on developing this written policy um, on responding to hate speech at RLS and I think it's so important um, that the students and the families have an understanding of what the expectations and practices and values are at the school level. Uh, we understand that uh, the school's individual policies, as was said, have been paused um, and it's understandable. It makes sense to have all of these be in alignment and um, I also know it's important to take enough time to be really thoughtful with the language. Um, but I also believe it's really important that the students and families have a policy in place at both the school and district levels at the start of the school year. Um, I think this sets the tone for the school year and is also something that, you know, in the beginning there's so many things as parents and students that we kind of sign on to and, and agree to um, together and I think that it's really important that this is part of that. Um, I'm wondering also if it's possible for the new superintendent to be involved in the drafting and I imagine that he might have some insight and input and also um, since it's something that he's going to be working with that it would be uh, really helpful to have that. Um, also some of the uh, models that we've been looking at as the parent committee have been um, policies and also um, data systems from um, Alameda and also Berkeley school districts. So it seems like there might be some helpful insight there. Um, I know there's some limitations with that with summer coming up and break in July, so I just wanted to see if there's any possibility of that. And to reiterate what Sean and Alicia mentioned about data tracking, and I think it's so important, as was said, um, so that we can have a sense of how interventions are working, but also so that we can really get a clear picture of what's been happening and what continues to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Come, come on up. Hi, good evening. My name is Elaine Lund and I live in St. Helena, 1166 Hudson. Uh, I've been a resident of St. Helena for 18 years and I have two daughters, a freshman at the high school and a sixth grader at RLS. Um, both my girls have been part of the Unified School District since kindergarten and for most part it's been a positive experience from student and from the parent perspective. Um, however, the last year I will say has been a bit frustrating and challenging, particularly for my sixth grader. She's either been on the receiving end of racial slurs, bullying, or have witnessed it happening to other students. Um, from my conversations with my daughter and other parents, this behavior is rampant in the sixth and eighth grade. I cannot speak for the seventh grade. Um, as Alicia and um, Sean and Brooke have mentioned, a group of invested and passionate parents formed an RLS uh, climate committee, subcommittee, to help support the school and students understand the school rules for hate speech, bullying and harassment as well as the enforcement of such. Um, one of our initial goals is to uh, work with Principal Cox on the discipline policy for hate speech and racial harassment. Um, we've been working on this since uh, March and we feel it's stalled out a little bit. We understand that there are board policies and ARs that are being reviewed and um, we don't feel that our current policy is we feel our current policy is in line with such and we don't feel that any changes made to the AR would um, have any major impact on a drafted policy. Um, I do want to thank the board for the, all the work that they've done, um, the things that uh, uh, Dr. Wilson has explained, all the actions that have been taken and I appreciate the June timeline. I'd be very interested in seeing the, uh, I believe it was the investigative or investigation form. Um, uh, we're also looking for, um, hopefully, that the new superintendent will have a chance to review the policy as well. Um, so really the first ask is that we would like a policy uh, adopted in place when school opens. 
Um, the other ask that we have is that um, in place by the end of the school year, we would like to see a plan for training teachers and office staff so that they have the proper tools to uh, enforce and execute um, this plan that's gonna be put in place. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Erica, either via Zoom or written comment? There were no written public comments submitted. If any of our Zoom participants care to share a public comment, please hover towards the bottom of your screen and raise your virtual hand. There's no Zoom public comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, trustees, um, questions, um, comments, uh, please feel, go ahead and start. Um, so uh, this tonight is the first that I've heard of um, a, pos a, a procedure of a tracking system, and um, that is very interesting to me. I think that would be um, a very effective tool um, to for us to um, deal with the situations that we have. Um, I think that uh, we'd have to, of course, investigate um, how we best could do that, but um, that would be something that I, I would think would be um, uh, a kind of a no-brainer. Um, yes, um, I look forward, thank you, to um, the board policy committee and the work that you've put forward with um, revising the board policy, um, creating the AR, and also creating the um, the other document with, um, please remind me, I want to get it wrong, the name of the document. Investigation form. The investigation form, so thank you for that. Um, when we get an opportunity to review the form in June, um, I would like us to consider at that time some additional time in July um, with our new superintendent after July 1 um, to make sure that we have time so we can begin, um, begin the school year August 10th with the new policy in place, um, perhaps to be able to have it printed out in the parent handbook so all parents receive it before school starts and that teachers have had some training um, either through the emails they can receive at home if there's not time I think they come back for two days but I don't know if that time is in class for them to get ready or if there is time for training in there um, just how it how we've already decided with the teacher union what those two days look like um, but again I would like to have some time in a special meeting in July where we can discuss it further if we feel like we need to in June to have it ready in August I think it is critical that we have start the year off with a new and uh, new documents in place and families aware Jeannie would you <clears throat> That's a, that's, um, I agree with that, um, Trustee Simon. I mean, I, I personally think that that's a great idea. I also, um, in the, I, I, I do want to say first, to thank you to the parents for all of your work um, on this. I, I, I'm very appreciative. And I also, um, I, I really um, am thankful for bringing um, other suggestions forward to us, that, you know, things that you've been thinking about. And I, I appreciate that. And I, so I'm, I'm going to say, I think that the, um, the annual site level report, I think, is actually a, a, would be a good tool for us as well. Um, only because I, and I, when I think about I, annual site report or any kind of annual report, that's what we do for a lot of our policies, and I think it's especially important for for this policy as well for the, the AR. Um, and then I, I like the tra I like the the tracking of the incidents. I think that that's important. And um, I have another one. Is the bear with me? Excuse me. Um, the um, um, similar to what you said, um, Trustee Simon, um, uh, training the teachers and office staff um, prior to when we the, the prior, as as the policy is being un, unfolded. Great. So, mm -hmm. thank you. I think they covered most everything that I was going to ask, but the timeline is is helpful as well, and just to kind of understand how, and also. Um, I think it's important for the community to know that, I mean, obviously the district and what what the timeline is and that it's got to be vetted and put through the and put through the board policy committee for final recommendation. And, and I do appreciate all the 
parent input on this um, and concur with the other trustees on the tracking system. And so I'm in agreement with that as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, I also want to just take a moment to thank the parents and uh, Principal Cox as well, because I this is a collaboration that has to come from home and school. It's you know it's not it, it's not something that's you know that, that relies solely on the shoulders of the school. And so I really am grateful that everybody's been respectful. They've taken the time. They've going through the proper you know protocols and the people. And, you know, truly, I, I think it's really wonderful of what's coming out of that. So thank you very much. Um, I also think it's imperative that we have something come August 10th. I mean, I feel very, very strongly about that. Um, and I'm willing, you know, we, normally we don't have a meeting in July, but I'm whatever we need to do to, to finalize that board policy to get it in place so that so that we can start the school year and families know students know this is what is expected and what will be tolerated and what won't be tolerated um i'm a fan of the annual site report as well um you know as you mentioned that we do get uh, annual reports on other things so it would make sense to get something like that um so I guess the question now becomes for us in what can be done, you know, why we have Dr. Wilson with us and other staff in the time that we have. Um, so it sounds like what we would like, um, I want to just kind of see where we can, how we're going to push this through for the next 30 days, let's say. Um, basically, we want an opportunity to, are you asking to see what the board policy looks like? As, it, as they have made adjustments to it as of right now, that's what I'm hearing that everybody would like to see. Is that correct? Okay. I, I, what I think, uh, what might be the timeline since we only have one uh, board meeting left mm -hmm. before summer recess, it would be, uh, my thought would be that we would have the policy presented and then, um, and then maybe have um, a if there are needs for change or advice, uh, uh, advice as to how we can make it better, maybe a special board meeting to um, to again discuss and approve if that's necessary. I, I just feel that um, it's been expressed by parents that I've talked to that we want to get this right. Doesn't right. we don't want it to be rushed, but we do want to have it in place. And I think that Trustee Simon um, said that. Uh, she was willing to do a, I think all of us are willing to do a special meeting over the summer. Is that correct? Yeah, it sounds like this is, I mean, this is, I don't, yeah. And I was also going to just suggest with the new superintendent uh, after yeah. July 1st, yeah. bring yeah. mom to that. Yeah, I think that that that's certainly makes sense. I, I just, I, I think what I'm, what I'm hearing, and I know that you're hearing as well, is let's bring it back to June ready, you know, ready for us to review so that that if there's further revisions, feedback necessary, that we have July to work on that so that it's ready to go August 10th. Does that sound clear? It does. So what we'll bring forward will be the board policy, which is an action item, mm -hmm. the administrative regulation, which is an information item, mm -hmm. the investigation form, which would be an investigation uh, information item. Okay. And so that all of you know, um, in that draft that is currently waiting for principal and board policy review, it does include an annual site okay. report. Okay. It does include uh, some kind of a tool for tracking because that's how you give an annual report. Uh, and it also includes training for staff, all staff and students. So all of that is already there. Okay. Um, the oversight committee is not there. And so that's something that I want to talk with the committee a little bit about. And, and what, and I appreciate the, the idea around using one of the current superintendent subcommittees to serve in that capacity. Um, so, uh, Yes, I understand uh, okay. my charge. Okay. And if I could, Ms. Madrigal, uh, in order for uh, this policy to uh, be a part of the back to school packets, when would you need those completed policies for printing to, to build those packets? We can always send a supplemental form. However, the secretaries prepare those packets before they leave, which is the last week of June. So that seems a, a little early. However, they will go out, I believe, 
the week of July the 10th or so. It's that second or third week right after the um, right after the 4th of July break. Those will be mailed out to parents. Okay. So there's a little time. So there's a little time. And a supplemental, while not ideal, because but it's possible. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. That seems, I, I'm, that's comfortable. I'm comfortable. Trustees, how do you feel with that? Laura, are you comfortable? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. I th we're moving forward. So um, I'm, th that makes me happy. And I, I know it's been a lot of long work and everybody's had to be patient. And I thank you again for your patience. But we do want to do this right. So um, onward and upward, I suppose. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we're going to move on to item 10B, which is the request to accept gifts, donations, and earmarked funds. Um, so I was going to ask uh, a trustee to read this. Mr. Olguin, would you like to do that? Sure. Okay, thank you. The board is asked to accept with gratitude the following donations. St. Lena Unified School District has received four HON lateral file cabinets with hanging file folders from Paula and John Murphy. St. Lena High School has received the following donations totaling 11084 uh, $1,000 uh, donated by Brian Henry, donated to St. Lena High School baseball program. $250 donated by Cynthia Keith, St. Lena High School uh, drama program. $1,373 donated by Community Foundation of the Napa Valley for the St. Lena High School 2022 scholarships uh, for the Kirsty Vengi, Kirsten Vengi Memorial Scholarship. $500 from Alliance Frances de Napa Incorporated, St. Lena High School uh, 2022 scholarships, Alliance Frances Scholarship. Sorry if I butchered that. I did take French, but <laughs> my French teacher hopefully is not watching. Uh, $500 from Carmen Policy, uh, St. Lena High School softball program, uh, softball uh, windscreens. $4,610 uh, donated by Saints Athletic Association for the St. Lena High School softball program. Again, softball windscreens. Uh, uh, $2,766 from Saints Athletic Association for the St. Lena High School volleyball program, uh, volleyball net system. $25 from David Bauer for the St. Lena High School, High School band program, uh, festival of music. And then $60 from Susan Ackman for the St. Lena High School band program. And so we thank all the donors and appreciate the support. Thank you very much. Um, okay, item uh, ten, uh, yes, 10C is the review of the CSBA governance self-assessment tool criteria and determined timeline. Um, I think, uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Do we need to accept the donations? Oh, my apologies. We, we most, I was so excited about our evaluation tool. I lost my, I lost my sense. Um, but are there any public comments, either in person, written, or via Zoom? Okay. okay thank you. Um, okay, uh, trustees, any, any questions or, okay. Is, is there a motion to approve? Um, the donations, gifts, and earmarked funds. Oh, motion to approve. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. As most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will conduct a roll call vote. Yes. Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Haug. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Olguin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Now we're on to the um, evaluation self governance, uh, governance self assessment tool. So um, as four of the five of us are familiar with this process, we've used it before. Uh, Trustee Simon, I, you've had a chance to um, look at the, at the attachments to that. Um, it's, it's no different than what we've done before. Our governance handbook re, you know, states that we uh, annually review and evaluate our goals and progress through a self-evaluation uh, uh, process. So we have that two-week window, uh, which kind of seems to be our window. Uh, there's not really a lot of wiggle room in there, given how we are, you know, marching towards the end of the school year here. So, um, is every have any questions about the process uh, or comments about uh, the tool? Any further discussion about it? No. No, I'm okay. 
Okay. Um, was there any public comment on this agenda item? Any written or Zoom? No public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have, well, it says here we can, that is a two week window right there, correct, Dr. Wilson? I believe that was our, is that correct? Okay, so that is gonna be our two week window. And it'll, you'll, you'll be, it'll be sent to you electronically like before, you will fill it out, it will get scored and uh, sent back to us, okay? Can I just, Yeah. I'd like to suggest um, for Trustee Simon, to, since it's your first one, we are gonna discuss it later on. So right. sometimes I take, well, I take notes on it just because of the way you answer, we sometimes will have a discussion and you may forget why you answered a certain way. So I, I, I think it's helpful with question. Yeah, it just, it's helpful when we discuss so we can all kind of share our perspectives of why we answered a certain way on the evaluation. Microphone. 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 If you answer online um, and you don't make a copy, then it's it, it's just uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Item uh, 10D is the board review po uh, potential approval of the district goals for 22-23. I'd like to call on Dr. Wilson, please. Yes, it's with pleasure I bring to you uh, suggested goals, district priorities for the 22-23 school year. You'll recall that you approved these goals uh, last year at this time, um, which were an update from the goals that we had had for the previous six years. These five goals are in alignment with the local control accountability plan. And um, it, Ms. Magical, if you could scroll back up to the top, thank you. Um, the first one is to increase achievement for, by all for all for all students, embrace racial diversity, equity, and inclusion, expand parent and community engagement, support physical and social emotional well being for all and maintain physically sound practices. The all in those, some of those goals are all, each letter is capitalized, that's to emphasize that all is every student every day. And then what you didn't see last year underneath each of those goals were the descriptors that the LCAP steering committee um, wrote to help us better understand um, when looking simply at this uh, single piece of paper instead of the very a lengthy LCAP, what each of these goals mean and how we can actualize them. Uh, I do recommend that you approve these goals for the 22-23 school year. Thank you. Is there anyone present or via Zoom or any written public comment on this agenda item? No? Okay. Trustees, any questions or comments on this agenda item? My comment would be I w I'm very happy to um, keep the goals the same as, as last year. Okay, great. Yeah, agree, stay the course on this, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm also in agreement. Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the district goals and priorities for the 22-23 school year as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll a second. second. Um, as most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will <clears throat> conduct a roll call vote. Will there be a preferential vote with Macy on this one? I say yes. yes. So can we go back and have yeah. that preferential vote and then get the second? Okay. Okay, thank you. Macy, would you like to cast a preferential vote? Yes, I. Okay. May I now have that second, please? I'll second. Thank you. Now, Dr. Wilson, if you would be so kind as to thank conduct you. a roll call vote. My pleasure. <laughs> Trustee Simon? Aye. Trustee Haug? Aye. Trustee Kerr? Aye. Trustee Olguin? Aye. President Pelosi? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now we're on to the adoption of Resolution 21-40 Pride Month, June 2022. And I'm gonna ask Ms. Macy Alvarez to be so kind as to read that resolution for us. Yes, of course. So um, the resolution began in 2020 when Joe Brody was serving as school board representative. Um, it was a student driven, driven initiative to fly um, the pride flag at the district um, flagpole. Um, as a way to celebrate diversity in our community. So I will go ahead and read the resolution. 
um, Resolution 21 through 40, Pride Month 2022, whereas the vision and mission of the St. Helena Unified School District promote a safe, supportive, and inclusive learning environment where all students can fully develop and as resilient, caring, and responsible individuals and citizens, and whereas the St. Helena Unified School District celebrates diversity in students, staff, and the com school community, and whereas the district is firmly committed to providing a safe, nurturing, and tolerant environment in our schools, and whereas the district is firmly committed to school safety for all students, staff, and family members, including the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning, LGBTQ community, or those that may be perceived as such. And whereas board policy 5145.3 prohibits discrimination in its programs and activities based on gender or sexual orientation, among other characteristics. And whereas June is a, is a symbolic month in which LGBTQ plus their families, friends, and allies come together in various celebrations of freedom and pride. Therefore, it be it resolved, the St. Helena Unified School District proclaims the month of June 2022 to be LGBTQ plus Pride Month and will honor and highlight the accomplishments and contributions of LGBTQ plus students, staff, and their families. Pride Month is an avenue to ensure that bullying, harassment, and discrimination based on real or perceived orientation, gender identity, and gender expression are deemed unacceptable in our community. Be it further resolved by recognizing Pride Month, the district continues to support all other policies, practices, and curricula that honor and respect LGBTQ plus students, staff, families, and the greater community. Passed and adopted this 19th day of May 2022 at a regular meeting by the following vote. Thank you. Is there any public comment, Zoom comment, or written comment on this agenda item? Okay. Trustees, any questions on this agenda item? No. Okay. Dr. Wilson, has there been any requests uh, given to you for uh, the flag to be flown out front? Yes, I received the request from Macy Alvarez um, with ample time per the administrative regulation and Mr. Sinto has ordered the flags and they will be ready to fly. There will be one uh, at the flagpole on Rotary Park and then uh, one, uh, Mr. Sinto, if I'm incorrect, please join the mi me, at, me at the microphone um, on the flagpole where the seniors like to sit in the quad. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, is, there, um, is there a motion to approve the resolution 21-40 Pride Month for June 2022? Motion to approve. Macy, would you like to cast a preferential vote? Absolutely, aye. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, um, as most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson, will you conduct a roll call vote, please? Yes, Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Haug. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Olguin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye, motion carries. We are going to just take a brief 10 minute comfort break uh, and then we'll return and uh, start with item 11A. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Okay, we will uh, reconvene and start with item number 11A which is the 2021-22, the LCAP update presentation on parent survey feedback. Um, I would like to remind the board that this is a written report um, presented to us this evening. Um, is there any public comment on this agenda item? Actually, I do believe um, Ms. Allen is going to present this well, item. Well, I apologize. I don't. I I was following my um, my script, and it is my error. Okay. And uh, Ms. Allen is prepared to share with you some information. We felt that as this was a new survey that it was important to provide you with information and opportunity for discussion. Great. Well, we appreciate that as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Ms. Allen and Mr. Heller are going to tag team this one. Even more, another surprise. <laughs> I'm, I, I apologize, everybody. That's okay. I, I'm a script follower, so I. That's a, no problem. Well, good evening. Um, we're going to take a look tonight at uh, the engagement survey from our parent and community partners, and so we'll we'll jump right in. We had ooh very fast. Now very slow. Well, we had 325 respondents, and this is how it broke down. The high school had the most. Um, respondents as you would figure with the, the most population and then we had equal numbers representing the other three school sites and now okay and uh, here's a breakdown of our ethnic uh, ethnicity and responses 
the most responses were in the white category and the second were in Hispanic. And then on our rating scale, um, Likert scale is what it's called. And then so if you're on uh, five is the highest score for strongly agree and one would be not observed or uh, the lowest score possible uh, for this particular survey. So we did have six questions. And so on the first question, Mary Allen will take that first one. Wasn't quite sure what you were going to do, Mr. Heller, there. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody, and I'm excited to be here. And, and what an appropriate topic tonight uh, because we've been hearing the parent comments. And certainly as a school district, you know what? We're not – we can't do it alone. It takes a village to raise the children, and it takes student voice. It takes parent and community partner voice, and it takes staff and teachers and administrator, administrators' voice. So I'm excited that we're here. I want you to know that we do collect parent information all year. We have committee meetings. We also, in years past, have done parent panels. We, we have also had town halls. This year we did an anonymous parent survey, and it's related to questions that are on the California School Dashboard. So this information, we're going to give a brief overview tonight. This information will come back again in the California dashboard that we present in June. So there's six questions on this survey. As Mr. Heller stated, we had 325 responses and really appreciative of that. So question number one, you're going to see a rating scale. So again, we were one where we didn't want to be all the way up to five where we want to be, and it gives us an average. So on the first question, the schools provide a welcoming environment for families in the community. We're at a 4.18, so that's around agree to strongly agree. Again, we want to be four or up on our, on our averages here. Uh, so on the next slide, I don't have the clicker, thank you. Uh, what I did, I did an overview of this, so I want you to understand that this is simply an overview of common themes that I was seeing within the responses. The principals will go get their own individual responses next week at our leadership council meeting. So each one of the comments will be seen by the site administrator for their site, and it's for them to respond to and address within their strategic plan. So this is a brief overview of the themes that I did see. So in reference to, uh, uh, for the first one, a welcoming community, I mean a welcoming environment, what I saw in reference to agree and strongly agree, I'm not going to read through all of these, but I can tell you that we had quite a few folks that thought we had welcoming uh, environments as well as good communication. On the Delta side, what we certainly can improve upon, and again, I'm not going to read all of these, but some of the main things is that we certainly need to do a better job of making sure that our bilingual uh, parents are supported and our communication is very clear, and also that we need to work on creating a better welcoming environment at each one of our school sites. Uh, that was across the board. It wasn't one site had that better than another site. We do need to improve upon. Now, keep in mind, we've had COVID for the past two years uh, our sites haven't been what they were prior to COVID so I'm hoping to get back and we know that we want to open up and welcome everybody next year and hopefully we'll see a totally different ballpark in reference to what parents are seeing for our, our school environments question number two is going to be Mr. Heller yes question number two is the school provide um, the schools provide multiple opportunities to engage in two-way communication between families and educators. And again, that was a right around the agree uh, rating at 4.09. And some of the comments, um, you know, it, it, if you look at one side, it, it, it's a positive um, response from some families. And then on the other side, it's uh, the level of communication uh, feels like it can improve or be more timely. So it might be just um, kind of one of those things that we need to take a look at by side of how we're delivering communication and uh, meeting our family's needs to make sure that they're informed. Um, the method of communication and how frequent and all of those types of, of questions that we have um, and continue to pose to our families. Uh, some like phone calls, some like texts, some like emails, some like none of the above because it becomes too much. So, you know, that's, that's some of the things we continue to grapple with and make sure that we're meeting our family's needs to communicate different things from the schools. Question three. 
Question number three is the schools provide families with information or resources to support student learning and development in the home, 3.9. I don't need to go through that. Uh, we want to get that again for 4.0 4 and above, uh, but it's close, but we need to improve upon that. I can honestly say that this is an area that I see as well. We do a really good job of supporting our students in reference to after school tutoring, before school tutoring, a lot of interventions, a lot of enhancement and enrichment. However, I think we can do a much better job of providing supports to the families for when the students come home and they need some additional resources. So I definitely see this. The responses, uh, again, what Mr. Heller was stating, we see that uh, we did have quite a few parents say that a lot of supports are provided and resources, but on the Delta side, we really need to provide additional support. So half our parents feel like we do and the other half feel like we don't. So clearly there's a, a message we need to get out there so all parents feel like we're supporting them at home and providing resources. Question four, the schools implement programs for teachers to meet with families and students to discuss student progress and ways to work together to support improved student outcomes. This is a little lower than four. This baseline score is a 3.6, so it's somewhere between neutral and, and degree. Um, and some of the feedback, uh, it, you know, indicates that, you know, again, it goes back to timely communication. Uh, there's a desire to, to meet and connect with teachers more frequently. Um, and, you know, some of the, the supports that we do have uh, are, are very helpful, as, as Ms. Allen already mentioned. Um, but again, we're, we're coming out of the pandemic, so, you know, we've had this uh, feeling for the last two years that uh, there needs to be more connection with, um, you know, face-to-face -face and in-person as much as possible. Question number five, the school builds the capacity, the school build the capacity of and support family members to effectively engage in advisory group and decision making. Uh, reading several of the comments all the way through, because I read the whole report, advisory uh, threw some parents off because they didn't know what we were saying in reference to that question. Uh, so I, I, that's on me and I apologize, I probably should have stated that a little different. So advisory did throw some parents off. But in reference to what we saw as far as in Cree, is that many uh, parents felt like they could be involved if they wanted to or if they were interested, but several are busy. Uh, on the Delta side, what I did see across the board is that we need to increase multiple ways and opportunities for parents to have a voice in decision making within the school district. And we clearly heard that tonight from several of our parents. And the last question, question six, the schools provide opportunities to have families, teachers, principals, and district administrators work together to plan, design, implement, and evaluate family engagement activities at school and district levels. Uh, a, th a score of 3.41, again, that's neutral. Um, it's not necessarily surprising, as I mentioned earlier, given the, the pandemic's impact on our ability to, to engage and uh, bring people onto our sites. Um, so we're hopefully moving out of that uh, into the, the endemic phase where we can uh, begin to invite and include our families a little bit more in the activities that are taking place, not only in the schools, but within the district. And so, um, yeah, I think I talked about those. Those are just some of the responses. And then kind of our next steps. So this data is included in our, our dashboard report that we're, we'll share with you in June. Uh, so these are, these are our baseline scores now. So this is, this is our metric that we're going to use as we evaluate next year and we can indicate and see how our scores improve or decline and what the responses are and we can uh, use that feedback to help inform our plans. Uh, not only does this help inform our LCAP, but it'll help inform uh, the principal site action plans for the 22-23 school year. Uh, so some of the information that Ms. Allen indicated that they'll receive on Tuesday begins that conversation about the things that they want to include uh, in those particular plans. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a later item about the LCAP goals focusing on uh, community engagement. So we'd be happy to entertain any questions at this point. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment, Zoom comment, or written comment on this agenda item? Thank you. Um, trustees, any questions, comments about 
this agenda item. Okay. Chris, I have a, or, or Mary, I have a question about when the uh, specific data that goes to the school site administrators is shared with them, how, and you, and the principals and the, uh, you, uh, Chris and Mary, which one of you are the ones that incorporate um, the information that's shared into, into incorporate into actions for the, for the school sites? Are you saying that? Neither of us for the school sites. For the, the, for the administration. The administrators are. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. So when, how are the school sites and the administration held accountable for meeting the actions that are required of them if there's if they where they see a need for improvement or where the school site wants to work on improvement in those areas well that's just, a, I, I just yeah i mean that's would, a great question like um it, it's that. something this is obviously the first time we've had this survey and then the conversation mm -hmm. so it is going to be kind of an open-ended conversation just with that same uh lens of how does this look or how are we going to evaluate ourselves and ensure that some of these pieces of uh, feedback are addressed so yeah. that that it um, I guess I'm saying there's not a template or a, a manual that we've already developed it is more of a conversation about okay we have all this data and feedback now now what are we gonna do right right and how does it look and so th those are conversations that we're gonna have um, in our meeting may I, add, a, may yeah. I add something on so part of the there's eight state priorities and one of those eight state priorities is parent engagement mm -hmm. and that's built into the LCAP. So what happens is that this information besides what this particular survey, there's a bunch of information that goes into the LCAP. The sites have to align their strategic plans with the LCAP and so part of that is parent engagement. What are you going to do to okay. increase parent engagement based on the feedback that you've received? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Trustees, any other questions or comments? No? But I, what I do want to say is um, I want to I, I want to thank and appreciate the, the parents for taking the survey um, and for the honesty in doing that. And and also the, the honesty of being able to talk about our challenges as we move ahead. I mean, that's really important because that's how we, how as a, any organization just gets better is by openly discussing it and, and, and making improvements. Yep. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do have to say I, some of the, the um, comments, um, when you read them, um, th they are disheartening uh, because I, I think that the district does try very hard um, to engage our parents and there are a lot of opportunities um, I, I know that we've always been saying that communication 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 but I think uh, President Pelosi you've um, said numerous times you know communication is a two-way street uh, there are a lot of um, uh, there are there are PTG groups there's the ELAC group there are committees that you can serve on and um, and they're not always full of parents. So there are a lot of opportunities. Um, we have to make sure that our parents know that these opportunities all exist. And, um, and maybe we have to find um, maybe a different ways of delivering that information, maybe through a different app or something. I, I just don't know why um, we're still getting these, sometimes these same um, comments over and over. And I think back to, um, you know, seven or eight years ago when we used to have numerous parent education evenings where literally it was me, my husband, and um, one of the teachers, Kara Doring, attending. And we had fantastic speakers and you know all of the staff here would be at them. And there were no parents in attendance and it was an announced over and over and over. And, and so when I hear some of these comments, I, I, I understand what parents feel and I am sympathetic, but I still remember what I experienced, that there, that there is a lot of, um, there, everyone has to step up to the plate, everyone. Um, I had just a couple questions. Um, I, one of the comments was about Aries on there again, and can you refresh my memory? Do we offer a, an Aries um, like training night, do we not? We do, okay. and we also, the the additional thing we added on this year, and, and compliments of Roxana right here, 
our district social worker, is that we have a, a bilingual Spanish-speaking person that's actually coming up here every week to teach technology to any parent that wants to know it in Spanish about ARIES, about our Google classrooms, whatever technology need they have, they can come on up and, and get the support that they need. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, I, I, which I'm sure this will be done through the site principles, but I, this information would be great to obviously get to parent groups you know, mm -hmm. have them talk about it. You know, it doesn't have to be every bullet point. And DLAC, ELAC, mm -hmm. all those people. I think back to when you would go to those ELAC meetings and present that kind of information. Those were well attended meetings mm -hmm. when all that kind of information was presented. So um, I, I hope that this gets disseminated to those groups to to realize that more people can be aware of what the positives are, what the challenges are. So. Thank you, though, for yeah. the time. Yeah. I would also um, suggest just for the people that did take the survey, making sure that they get updated, because I know for people that take surveys, you want to feel like your voice is heard, and, and also just knowing that they're going to take your information and make some changes. So I think it's important that they receive that information of what's happening with their with the data that they receive. So. It was, uh, it was anonymous, so I'm not able to send it back to them. Um, we could put this, uh, you know, this information certainly is going to be, at, uh, it's in the board docs, but it, we certainly can put it on the website. Okay. Face page. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustees, anything else? Any? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, item 11B is the 2021-22 LCAP plan update, and this is the St. Helena Primary School data trends, and I'm going to ask Ms. Rebecca Rocha to come to the podium. Good evening, <clears throat> members of the board, Superintendent Wilson, um, and members of the executive cabinet. Um, this is uh, our school's presentation on data trends. I was told I could only have three side slides. I have a few more than that. I'll try to go quickly. Um, I, this uh, presentation is in two sections. Um, I'll start where we have math and reading. I'll start with math. We're presenting our scores on the MAP test, which is the measurable measures of academic performance. In K2, we don't have, we don't give the, um, the S back. Um, so this is our version of, the, of our standardized test that we give. And these are the scores um, on, you can see how our school compares to the national norms, the national average. So you can see that as a school in each grade, we're slightly higher than the, than the national norm national mean this is um, these this slide represents the current achievement gap um, I, I rushed back to my office after the dinner because I, it occurred to me that I might have an error on my slide and I re-examined the data this is not the percentage of students it's the number of students in each grade level so you can see that we do have an achievement gap between our um, Hispanic Latino students and our white students so again for example in first grade we have 11 um, Latino students who scored who, uh, at or above grade level in math and versus 21 students in first grade who scored at or above grade level. This was in winter of 2021. I wanted to see if there had been an, imp an improvement within that subgroup. Um, so I looked at those students who are currently in second grade. I looked at the Latino uh, student scores in first grade to see if from winter of first grade and winter of second grade, there had been an improvement. And you can see that growth was made with that group of students within one year. In terms of the reading scores, um, I, we're also looking at the, the MAP um, test. And again, looking at that subgroup from first grade to second grade, the, the um, percentage of students that met that were at or above grade level did improve slightly um, from one year to the next from when they move from first to second grade and then since I presented to you earlier in the year about our local assessments and especially focusing on second grade our reading assessments knowing that our second grade students um, were significantly impacted by learning loss because they left school in March of 2020 and now they're in second grade um, and this was some data that I had presented earlier in the year that when we started in August um, using our diagnostic reading assessment, which is a DRA, 
that's a that's an assessment where the teacher sits one on one with the student and gives them a reading assessment where they read to the teacher. So obviously those scores will be different than a student taking a test on the computer. What I didn't say about those map tests is students are taking them on a computer individually. So you it's slightly different than a teacher sitting in front of them. So beginning of the year we had 17% of our second graders reading at a second grade level. As of April, we did not have, we had moved all the students out of any kindergarten reading range. Um, I can't read the number. 33% <laughs> were reading in August at a, were reading at grade level, at or above grade level. And as of April, 54% were, are now, were reading at grade level. And teachers will be assessing the end of May, beginning of June. So I anticipate that to go up as well. Um, in terms of next steps for next year, we have many. These are just some of them. So we are considering the adoption of a supplemental phonics program for next school year. We have realized that um, our phonics instruction is not as robust um, as it should be. In fact, many of the publishing companies have um, now published additional phonics programs and our English language arts adoption benchmark also has a new phonics adoption that supplements the one that we're currently using. Um, we are going to increase our reading intervention time blocks to 30 minutes daily. This was the first year that we had a full-time reading intervention specialist and we had experimented with 20-minute groups so she could see more students and now we're doing 30 minute groups and based on best practice and feedback that we've gotten, those students really need to be seeing her for 30 minutes um, when they go. We are going to form a math alignment articulation committee with one representative per grade level. Um, so we'll have a K through second grade committee working with our math intervention teacher on just making sure that um, those teachers are getting information about best practices in math and ways to track data and then bringing that back to their grade level. We will also continue with the math intervention support that we've had this year. And we also um, want our math intervention teacher to really assist the staff with specific strategies um, that will focus on our Latino students that are approaching the grade level mean on the map. So who are those students that are close to being able to move over to be at or above grade level, where we know we focus on all students and we offer different <laughs> forms of intervention and support, but how can we really move those students that are close and to being able to, to move and what does that involve? And then um, we want to be able to provide after school math tutoring. So those are just some of the next steps for next year. Are there questions? Is there any public comment, Zoom comment or written comment on this agenda item? Um, trustees, any questions on this agenda item? Go ahead, if anybody's. Okay, Laura, do you? Yeah, I have, I have a question. Going back to slide four. Okay, so looking, great, thank yes. you, sorry. Um, so winter measures, this was the second MAP test that they took in math this year? Correct, they take one in the fall, and they take one, they take fall, winter, spring. So okay. this was the second time, yes. Okay. Um, do you have the data, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it, looking at um, the fall, the what the scores were in the fall? I don't, I have that data, but I didn't include that on this, okay. on this in this presentation, okay. but I do have that. Great, yes. yeah. so how can I see that? I Is have that a much longer report. <laughs> Okay. that I could send you. Thank you. Yes, I, I shared that report with the staff and it actually includes um, slides that are showing if students, especially our subgroup, Latino subgroup, if they're meeting the projected growth outcomes. There's, yeah, there's lots of different uh, data slides and I can double check to make sure that we're comparing fall to winter. I know that one thing that um, this, because I'm new to the school and I'm new mm -hmm. to MAP, one thing that the second grade teachers have shared with me is that in the sp there's two different map tests that they take in second grade and there's a k2 test and there then there's a 2-5 test and oh. in the spring they take the 2-5 test and so that test is more rigorous than the k2 test and so the teachers have begged me can we please give the k2 test all year so we can measure because the cal i guess the rigor changes in how the questions are presented so yeah that's not exactly sense. the same okay yeah. thank you 
quick question on the just because we were talking about parent support and engagement um and i don't know with COVID, obviously it, i'm sure there wasn't opportunities but is there any opportunities for like math nights or literacy nights or, or has that yes this we year? we did hold those this year on zoom um because that was we did them in the fall and we did one on specifically for math where we were focusing on math games and we sent materials home with students and then on zoom we showed the parents how to play the games with their st with their students that focused on math skills but for sure next year we'll do that in person and from what i've heard from the teachers they have done those always in years past and they're very well attended um, and also with any student with our mtss program um, our multi multi-tiered systems of support for any student not based on the map scores but based on their grade level benchmark assessments with the math curriculum that they use in the classroom for students that are below the cut point in math um, every six weeks teachers are are measuring their progress and they're meeting with parents if students aren't meeting those cut points and they're communicating you know that their student hasn't met the cut points and they're giving them some tangible things that they can do at home with their student we also know that it's not on parents to be responsible for teaching their students but we want to make sure that they're leaving with tools in hand to do so. We also have given iPads to all of our students that are tier two or tier three, meaning they require a, some small group instruction or intervention in reading or math. And so with the idea that they would work on Dreambox or Reflex Math at home, um, and then for reading that they would use some other, another reading app called Reading A to Z. Um, unfortunately, we've checked and a lot of the students aren't using, they're not using those apps at home. So we have to circle back and figure out how we, we offered prizes and um, there, there, there are some students that are using them, but um, not the amount that we passed out for them to use. And just to clarify, I, my question is the continue with the math intervention support, that's still the pull out of the small groups from when, when the class is in math, correct? Yes, so the students <clears throat> are in their classroom for the instruction of the lesson with the teacher. And they do um, when they're when after the teacher teaches the lesson and they do a few practice problems together. It's very strategic. That's when the math intervention teacher pulls the small group out and works with them on that same um, standard. And then those teachers are giving an, an exit ticket every week, which is just a quick assessment to see if you know are they making growth in that? Do they still need to stay with her? And it's very flexible. So those okay. groups can fluctuate from week to week. Of course, we know some students are continue to struggle. And so they've always been with her. But it's really they're, they're measuring their progress every week based on what they're working on. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah. Trustees, any other questions? No. I do just want to comment that our students are working very hard. Our students that struggle, as well as our students who have proficiency in math they're all working very hard great thank you okay item 11c is the report on our uh, 2022 summer school program and maybe this is where i was looking at because this is a written report um <laughs> uh, is there any public comment zoom comment or written comment on this agenda item Trustees, any questions on about this agenda item? I do. Okay. I was wondering if there's any measurements that are put in place to gauge to gauge uh, positive progress in social emotional development or uh, academics. I guess just over the summer, is there a way that you guys are going to like see if there was an improvement with your with the students that attended? It's 14 days. Our summer school is 14 days. And so we're working on social emotional. We're actually using Second Step. And Up Valley Family Center actually teaches those lessons for us for our third through eighth grade students that are in summer school. So they do, it's not so much of a measure, it's more of just informal observation and conversations with the students. I can tell you from last year to this year, that's the first time we did it, where we had Up Valley provide the SEL. Those kids circled back around at the elementary school are, and are in small groups. So the relational and the connections were made. And those kids are continuing with our elementary uh, school counselors. In reference to our SMART goals, that's what they work on. They work on reading and math during summer school. 
The other component we added was PE. So we felt like we really needed to deal with the whole child last year. We'll continue with the whole child this year. So they have academics, which is based on SMART goals, based on where they're at when they come into summer school. Each site is responsible for creating those. And then by the end of summer school, we hope they're, they're uh, achieving their SMART goals that they were working on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Appreciate you compiling all that information for us to review. You're welcome. Item 11D is the 2021-22 California Interscholastic Federation Annual Report from St. Helena High School. Um, I would also like to remind you that this is a written report. Um, is there any public comment, written comment, or Zoom comment on this agenda item? No. Trustees, any questions about this agenda item? All right, thank you. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the item E, which is the public hearing regarding the 2022-23 local control ability, accountability <laughs> plan. Okay, i get my, hello, Mr. Heller, please. <laughs> All righty, um, the uh, draft local control accountability plan for 22-23 is presented tonight for a public hearing for the, uh, input from the community, stakeholders, and the governing board. Uh, recommendations given tonight will be reviewed for possible consideration in the final document that will be presented back to the board in June. Uh, district staff will continue to work with our partner, um, Lucy Pearson, Lucy Pearson Edwards from the Napa County Office of Education in the refinement of this document so it can be approved by the Napa County Office of Education if and when approved by the governing board in June. Overall, there's some there's very there's very small minute refinements in the plan I, I trustee Kerr you mentioned that earlier with the goals and actions of the district we're, we're very happy with the progress and direction um, that that we're making in each of these areas and we want to keep the goals the same and uh, you can see within the plan there's just some minor tweaks within uh, those those actions that are presented so nothing uh, there's no new action or, or anything that would would um, uh, be necessary to point to it's just little refinements in the things that we're already doing um, I do want to um, make sure to acknowledge uh, this plan uh, is, is a complete team project and um, Mary Allen has done a tremendous job of compiling all the data and the metrics that you see um, and, and a lot of the analysis that's included in the LCAP uh, as she's uh, very familiar with the data and is able to, to provide that level of analysis for us. And uh, you may note that this particular year, the LCAP has a, a, a tremendous amount of budgetary uh, line items that it did not contain in previous years. And so that's required a little, a lot more work. I was gonna say a little more work, but a lot more work uh, from Andy Stubbs as well. So. Uh, big shout out to both of them for, for their work and their diligence in, in compiling all of that to present the plan for you and the community tonight. So at this time, I even have the timer ready to go for one minute because I know we have a one minute public <laughs> hearing. Uh, so I will, I'll start that on your, your command. Okay, great. The public hearing for the 2022-23 Local Control Accountability Plan is now open at 8.23 p.m. Oh. Comments during this public hearing should be limited to the LCAP. It is our goal to hear from all who wish to be heard. We now invite members of the audience to address the Board of Tr Trustees on the LCAP only. And we will sit for one minute because that's what we're at least required to do, the one minute threshold. Mr. Heller, I'll wait for your signal. Thank you. We have the beeper. Oh, you've got a beep. Okay. Got beep. Thank you. 
the governing board has not heard any comments or, in, or concerns, and, but we thank you very much for, for waiting with us. The public hearing is now closed at 8.24 p.m. Trustees, do you have any questions about the 2022-23 LCAP? No? I have a quick question. And so with, if there was any kind of modification then, is it under, is it, would we see that where it says modified action, I'm assuming, and this is like on the on the matrix? Yeah, on, on the actions, it'll say modification right below the, the particular action of what, how we're going to modify that particular okay. one. Okay. So it has the action from last year and then the modification below that. Okay, it says like modified edits, yes. and that's that. Right. And those are the that's the modifications that any when you see that that's the modifications of this. Correct uh, within okay. that action. Okay, yes. perfect, perfect. Um, you know, this is also, and we say this every time. I know every year, it's just like this is really an important document, and it would be great. You know, the community should really take the time to to read it to see what we're doing as far as our um, um, everything that's going on in our school district because we we do. Um, have a lot of resources and we um, provide a lot of resources for our, for our students, which I, I, I personally feel very fortunate about. And I'm, um, we're lucky to, to be in this district, yeah. all the resources, yeah. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you to all three, or I know that it's the entire staff, but you three in particular, it's a, like Jeannie said, or Trustee Kerr said, it's a long document. I know most people aren't gonna read the 102 pages, but <laughs> I put out the, the page numbers 12 to 20 is just a good overall um, yeah. place to start if you want to just kind of like understand the basics of it and then 24 to 61 if you want to see a deeper um, description of the LCAP and what's tied to it that's what so anyone out there on YouTube it you wants just to gave like a cliff note it's like a cheat, cheat, cheat kind of thing <laughs> 12 to 20 because no one's gonna read 102 <laughs> <laughs> thank you I agree as well thank you everybody for your work on that I just, I, I want to echo thanks. Um, I know uh, Mr. Heller, uh, you um, recognized uh, Mary Allen and Andy Stubbs, but uh, it, it's your report. I mean, you, you, it, I know it's everyone's report, but right. you do a, a lot of work on it, and we really appreciate the work that you've been. Thank you. It's, um, it's a book. Yeah. It's, 100, <laughs> it's 102 pages. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to uh, item 12A, which is the consideration of approval for the 2022-23 declaration of need. And I'm gonna ask Mr. Heller to take it from here, please. Yes, uh, each year we're asked to file the declaration of the need with the Napa County Office of Education for short-term credential waivers uh, in the event we may need teachers who do not possess a credential. Although we don't foresee this occurring, all of our teachers are credentialed in their field. Uh, the Declaration of Need does provide us with flexibility with the California Teaching Commission uh, to estimate positions we may need in case a, a situation does arise. Um, and so I would ask that you approve the uh, positions that we've uh, enumerated this evening uh, for consideration and approval. Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda, agenda item via in-person, Zoom, or written public comment? No? Okay. Trustees, any questions about this agenda item? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the approval, to, motion to approve the approval for the 22-23 declaration of need as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. As most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will conduct a roll call vote. Yes, Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Haug. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Olguin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we're gonna move on to item 12B, which is the oral recommendation regarding salary and or fringe benefits for Mr. Ruben Aurelio, a candidate for the St. Helena Unified School District Superintendent position. Um, a little uh, content here for everybody. At tonight's regularly scheduled board meeting, the governing board is asked to approve an employment contract with Mr. Ruben Aurelio beginning July 1, 2022. For the purposes of full transparency, I will provide an oral summary of the salary and compensation for the superintendent prior to the board taking action to approve the employment contract. From July 1, 2022 to July 30th, 2023, the district shall pay the superintendent 
an annual salary of $265,000. The superintendent salary for the 2023-24 school year, July 1, 2023 through July th June 30th, 2024, shall be negotiated in good faith between the district and the superintendent in the spring of 2023 based upon the performance goals and objectives of the superintendent in the superintendent's last evaluation. The superintendent's salary for the 2024-2025 school year, which is July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025, shall be negotiated in good faith between the district and the superintendent in the spring of 2024 based upon the performance goals and objectives of the superintendent in the superintendent's last evaluation. The superintendent's compensation also includes the same health, dental, vision, life insurance, and Section 125 benefits that are offered to other management personnel of the district, as well as a monthly car allowance of $700 per month and up to $10,000 in reimbursement for one-time actual moving expenses. Okay. Now we'll move on to item 12C. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, review and consideration of approval for an employment contract between Ruben Aurelio and St. Helena Unified School District for the position of superintendent. Uh, the background information is there. Um, I think I should, uh, is it customary that I normally read this? Can anybody, or just let it be on the screen? I need a little guidance on this. Erica, do you? Are you asking if you should read the entire contract? The, no, the background information. No, no, not the entire contract. <laughs> I just didn't know if I needed to read the um, background information. I'd have probably not, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So now I'm going to ask Miss Andy Stubbs to take it from here. Uh, the contract that you see there provides, and we can maybe scan through it, uh, includes the full provisions of compensation that President Pelosi read during the earlier board item, uh, all the terms associated with the contract, and the board is asked to uh, approve this contract with Mr. Aurelio. Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item, either in person, written, or via Zoom? Okay. Trustees, any questions about this agenda item? No questions. No? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the employment contract between Mr. Ruben Aurelio and St. Helena Unified School District for the position of superintendent as presented? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. As most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will conduct a roll call vote. Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Howe. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Olguin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye. Motion carries. Item 12D. Give me one moment here, please. Review and consider approval of the 2023-2022-23 salary schedule for the St. Helena Unified School District Superintendent. Um, I might, sorry, I don't know if my, there it is, okay. Mrs. Andy Stubbs, please. Thank you. And it's appropriate to have a salary schedule for each of our positions across the district. And so this salary schedule simply uh, restates the salary that was previously mentioned and is included in the contract. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who wishes to publicly comment on this agenda item? Ms. Madrigal, anything? Okay. Thank you. Trustees, any questions about this agenda item? No. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the 2022-23 salary schedule for the St. Helena Unified School District Superintendent as presented? Motion to approve. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. As most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will conduct a roll call vote, please. Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Haug. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Olguin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye. Motion carried. Um, at this time, I would like to ask Mr. Ruben Aurelio to come up to the podium and we welcome him and congratulate you on your upcoming position as the superintendent. <laughs> A lot of emotions right now. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Board President Pelosi, trustees, 
Superintendent Wilson, uh, staff, parents who are here. I know a lot of parents left, but everyone who was here this evening, um, I'm very honored to be here this evening accepting this position um, as the next superintendent of St. Helena Unified School District. Um, with me this evening is my wife, who's back there, Kristen, and I, I need to earn some brownie points, so I'm going to say a little bit about my wife. Um, she is the Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid for UC Berkeley Law School. Um, I have a lot of admiration for her. Uh, she is also the Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Law School Admissions Council. And she also sits on the Board of Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund and keeps me very honest in the work that I do. So that's a really important piece. Um, I also can't be here without uh, mentioning my three sons who are not watching because they're 24, 21, and 17. Um, but they'll hear all about it this evening when I go home. Um, lastly, I just really am going to keep this brief this evening because it's been a long evening. I'm really excited. It was wonderful to hear all the public comments this evening. I already have three tasks, I think, I've, that have been assigned. Um, and I'm very excited to jump in with the staff and really um, work on just taking us to the next level. There's a great foundation in place for St. Helena, and we're ready to innovate and really expand the work that we do. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all. We're excited as well, Mr. Rorilio. Thank you. Come on over and, really and come on over to the dais, if you would. <laughs> Okay, we're now um, we're going to take a photo as well. <laughs> Congratulations, President Hauk, uh, Maria, Miss uh, Trustee Simon, you're going to take a photograph. Yeah. Hi, Lisa Pelosi. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you for being here. Okay, we're going to move on to 13A, which is the draft 2022-23 original budget board review and public hearing. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Handy Stubbs to take it from here. Thank you. And this is the first time that the board will be seeing the uh, original budget for 2022-23. And we will also have to conduct a public hearing. So the first couple of slides uh, depict some detail about our revenue for 2022-23. Uh, as the board knows, we can now budget for about 2% property tax growth in the out years. Uh, and so that is improving our financial outlook, which is great. Uh, also, as the board knows, 2022-23 uh, is the last year of district of choice funding, and so that's pulled out of the budget for 23-24 and beyond. Uh, and then also we've got quite a few adjustments to restricted federal and state one-time funding. Uh, and then here we have some uh, revenue assumptions that are built into the local control funding formula, which uh, we do this district, uh, we are basic aid district, but we still have to complete that calculator every year. And you will see that um, the very last line there talks about a statutory COLA. 
Now, as a basic aid district, the COLA does not apply to our primary source of funding, our um, LCFF sources, which make up about 88% of our total funding. It only applies to programs outside of that funding, so special education, for example, and child nutrition and the mandated block grant. And we did receive recently the information from the May revise, and so the COLA of 5.33% with the May revise is actually uh, 6. 5-6% now with the May revise. And so you'll see that reflected in the presentation that comes to you June 16th. The next couple of slides talk about expenditures for the next three years. And uh, so as you can see, we have our usual 2% built in for step and column. I'm happy to report that STRS, the STRS rate will remain steady over the next three years. Uh, CalPERS is going up a little bit. Unemployment insurance, which went up to 0.50% uh, uh, due to the pandemic, is now going back down over in the two out years to 0.2%. And we always budget for about a 10% medical benefits increase every January. Also included in the budget for next year, uh, with regard to personnel expenses, we have uh, a little bit of a net increase in technology staffing to accommodate a new director of technology and information systems position. We've added back one full-time floating custodial two position, which is reinstated from uh, pre-pandemic staffing levels. Uh, we've got a placeholder for two additional paraeducator positions, and I do want to chat about this one for a little bit. Um, since preparing this for board first review and public hearing of the original budget for next year, we've reviewed staffing a little bit more and determined that it would be appropriate to restore one full-time special education teaching position in lieu of one of these paraeducator positions. And so the board will see that change reflected in the final budget that comes to them on June 16th. Uh, we also have a placeholder for up to six additional hours of food services assistant two time, uh, in addition to the three that we have already built into the budget starting this year, and uh, that will be paid for with increased revenue um, for our food services program resulting from the conversion to the Universal Meals for All program. We've built in projected net savings from our STRS retirement incentive, which is in the current uh, collective bargaining agreement with SHTA. SHTA. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, many adjustments to our expenditure budgets aligned with some of those one time uh, resources that we're receiving from the pandemic. Uh, and then also, this budget includes building back uh, contributions to deferred maintenance and our a special reserve for capital outlay, which we had temporarily frozen uh, due to um, the outlook of our property tax revenue. This is a snapshot of our multi-year projection. So as you can see, for 2022-23, we've got a, a healthy uh, budgetary surplus, uh, and then also in the two out years. And you can see our available reserves by percent at the bottom there, approximately 29% in 2022-23. And then uh, this is our required reserve statement, and this is included in the full budget package for the board to review. Um, and so you can read all the detail there about the, the different set aside amounts for things like our future ready classrooms program, uh, technology infrastructure, and so forth. And then what's most notable about our, our uh, reserve set asides this time around is we're earmarking about $2 million for some high priority deferred maintenance projects that are coming up, for example, roof replacement at the high school. And then uh, finally, just talking about what to expect next. The original budget will come back to the board on June 16th, and between now and then, I will be analyzing the governor's May revision of the 2023-223 state budget, and uh, then, of course, reviewing any final updates to the LCAP. And uh, we are in the process of completing, hopefully, negotiations with our bargaining units this spring. 
Um, and then also going through and finalizing the 21-22 budget and determining if there's any implications for next year as we start to close the books for this year. And so with that, I would ask the board to conduct a public hearing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the public hearing for the 2022-2023 budget is now open at 8.45 p.m. Comments during this public hearing should be limited to the budget. It is our goal to hear from all who wish to be heard. We now invite members of the audience to address the Board of Trustees on the budget only. <laughs> the governing board has not heard any comments or concerns this evening. Uh, the public hearing is now closed at 8.46 p.m. Do the trustees have any questions about the 2022-23 budget? I have a quick question. So on, um, on five, on slide five, um, just to, um, the food service assistance, the six additional hours, I'm just, is it, is, are you envisioning like a, a, another position or is adding on to hours to position, to other positions that are there? That's a good question. It, it, it uh, looks as if we'll be adding another five hour position and then maybe in increasing some hours to some current position. Okay. Okay. So a new position then, possibly yes. a new position. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the, um, the governor's um, May revision and things, do, th does, do these numbers have those revisions in there yet then, or you're just wanting to finalize those and then that's, then you'll do more work on this when they come through? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, this does not include the May re revise information yet. Okay, yeah, Thank we you. anticipate some additional one-time revenue and things like that. and and uh, some changes to lottery allocations and mandated block grants and so forth. And so the final June budget will incorporate all that. Awesome, great, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you. I, I just thought of something actually, and it's probably in there, I just don't remember seeing it. Um, the uh, busing, um, are we purchasing the bus? Um, are we looking to purchase the buses? This year, and are we getting the um, grants for that, or looking to, uh, uh, assuming we're getting the grants for that? That's a great question, also, and we will become eligible for some electric bus replacement grants in December, uh, and those grants for which we'll be applying would cover all the expenses related to to doing a conversion. Uh, I haven't built those into the budget yet, though, because it'll that'll be uh, unknown whether or not we'll get those grants. Thanks. Okay, item 13B, Enrollment Projection Study, April 2022 presentation. Um, please, Ms. Zandy Stubbs. I'm very proud of the apples, by the way. I like those. <laughs> They're very colorful. I like them. <laughs> Okay. 
Thank you. So we have had some enrollment projection studies done in the past, uh, most recently in 2016 and 2019. And both of those studies indicated that residential student enrollments are expected to decline over the next several years. We had an updated enrollment projection study prepared by King Consulting, and that study also projects declining enrollment through 2028-29. And so this table shows you uh, visually the um, projected decline. We did have a strong increase in 2018-19 uh, where we went up to 12,067 students due to higher birth rates in 2013. Oh, 12, I, can't, I have to get my contacts changed out. <laughs> uh, and then also some stronger than usual in migration of students in the grade levels shown. And uh, the declining enrollment in the out years projected is due to local birth rate data. Uh, and this table here does include students that are currently enrolled in our district of choice program through graduation just for the purposes of projection. Uh, and as the board knows, district of choice will end after 22-23 unless it's extended by legislation. And this slide here shows a breakdown of our current out of district enrollment uh, students by program. We have a total of 124 students enrolled in our district who do not reside in St. Helena's boundaries. Uh, and so you can see the, all the different districts and then we have 98 students who are participating in district of choice. We have 21 students who are here under the Allen Bill which is tied with uh, employees and so employees by virtue of the Allen Bill may bring their, their children to our school district. And then finally five that are on uh, an inter-district transfer agreement through board resolution. The next slide shows the same information, but this time broken down by grade level. And uh, while we're looking at declining enrollment over the next several years, two factors impact, um, impact that. Transitional kindergarten, which is expanding over the next four years into full grade level by 2025-26, and also the city of St. Helena is anticipating some increased residential development in response to uh, its regional housing needs allocation requirement, which, which is the need essentially for more affordable housing, uh, which generates more students per unit than any other type of housing. And so uh, a little bit more detail about residential development planned. Uh, King Consulting contacted the following planning departments that you see on the slide there to confirm information relative to projects that could result in new students for our district. Uh, and so you've got a description there, of the city of St. Helena, uh, what they're estimating for housing and they also looked at some development in Lake County for example because we do have students that come from Pope Valley because they may choose uh, any high school um, within the state of California. Uh, Pope Valley students and Hell Mountain students may. And so to summarize before we open it up for board questions and discussions, um, while there, while the additional housing and full implementation of expanded TK is will have an impact and increase enrollment slightly in 2025-26, um, until there's an increase in local births leading to larger kindergarten cohorts, enrollment will continue to decrease over the next several years. And, uh, and so we do have some next steps that we have to discuss. We'll be monitoring uh, the California Department of Education for updates on the district of choice requirements. Uh, they will uh, update participating districts on next steps and state um, legislate, um, legislation would have to be extended uh, by virtue of state action which would have to occur by October 2022 for the district of choice program to be extended and so that's very unlikely. Um, so a very important next step will be to notify the public that uh, the district will not be accepting new district of choice applications for 23-24 um, because it will be very likely that the district of choice program will, uh, will be over at that time. 
And so in view of that, it'll be important for the Board of Trustees to review and update Board Policy 5117, uh, which, is addre which addresses interdistrict attendance. Uh, and there are several considerations. The board will need to consider the status of current students enrolled through the District of Choice program, uh, as well as look at future enrollment caps and uh, review possible interdistrict attendance options. And then uh, aligned with reviewing board policy 5117, the board will have to also update administrative regulations 5117 and 5117.1. And then, of course, implement and communicate all the new policies and procedures to uh, to the public, to the community. And so with that, I would ask if the board had questions. Thank you very much. Is there any public comment, either in person, written, or Zoom, on this agenda item? Trustees, any questions about this agenda item? So, um, I, I do have more, um, more of a uh, just observations of looking at the declining enrollment, um, and maybe just more um, uh, voicing some realities that. For more for our community to understand that enrollment is declining across the state. This is this is not just a St. Helena issue. Um, we've all heard about the schools in Napa Unified being closed. So, um, and I'm also um, uh, interestingly, um, uh, we we have lowered our caps um, because for for. Um, uh, reasons that were at the time uh, necessary because we had to we had to look at what the situation we were in during COVID. We had to look at um, what a high cap for our kindergarten meant for our district. Um, there, there are uh, I believe it's uh, ninth grade. We did not even meet our cap uh, last year. Is is that correct? Even with district of choice okay so um, I'm looking at you know we were uh, this is a time for discussion of what enrollment looks like even if we have higher caps we have to look at we might not be getting students in to keep our enrollment um, at the levels that the district has been used to so um, so it's something we have to address so I mean if we're not if, if if we're lowering our caps to 110, they were for years they were at 120 students at the at the high school per grade, and we lowered it to 110. And we had ninth grade is our grade where we have a lot of students coming in usually. And if we're not even reaching those lower caps, we have to we have to understand that you know how how are we going to maintain the size of our district and um, and and um, how do we move forward because it's it is a statewide issue correct I agree and it is going to be it is the the balancing conundrum issue before us because you know it's declining enrollment if you do you know then we also are going to have universal TK that comes in that's not going to be funded for community funded districts exactly. so that's an additional expense for our for our district and you know district of choice goes away and with it any funding that we did receive so it, it it's going to require i mean it will require undoubtedly a study session for us it's you know to to look at this and um and and i don't know when the appropriate timing will be for that study session um but it's it's going to be warranted, I, I believe. We're going to have to look at it. Um, I'm open to hearing, obviously, from everybody else. But um, you know, I, I think what we've what we've been learning through our meetings and and readings and whatnot, it's highly unlikely that DOC is going to be continued on the state level. So, you know, we have this next steps about reviewing and update the policy, which we know has already been in the works. You know, at the very low level, 
with legal and seeing what's possible. So we're going to continue on that. But I do think we, with this information, you know, um, personally, I'm not very optimistic about all this housing that's being projected because it doesn't seem like housing moves very quickly in St. Helena in general. Um, and I don't want to put my eggs in that basket entirely because I don't necessarily believe how quickly that can happen. That's just a personal feeling I have. Um, so I think, to your point, we do need to um, have some kind of study session on that and see and flesh it out and see what it looks like and see what our options are. And I don't know if anybody else in the administration has a, a, a suggestion on when that might be the best time for us to do that. <laughs> is what I'm going to say. <laughs> One of the questions that you need to wrestle with is whether or not, if there is legislation and district of choice is extended, do you as a, as a, as a board intend to stay in district of choice? Because if you do, then that work that you're talking about may not be as necessary. If you, um, if you, aren't sure and you want to await uh, to determine what the California Department of Education um, guidance is with regards to district of choice, you'll know that guidance by October of the 22-23 school year, which will give you ample time to um, bring legal counsel um, under the support of Andy Stubbs to a study session and or a board meeting to work through um, with your superintendent the potential changes to the board policy for inter-district transfer and what that's going to look like okay. and how many students you, you know, enrollment caps as well. So all of that work could be accomplished between the months of October to January, um, which would prepare people who are interested in the district um, for notification and or a process, you know, starting potentially in February or March for the twenty. 324 school year. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for providing that context on the sure. timeline. And Ms. Stubbs, would you um, offer any different ideas around what I just shared? No, that, that covers it. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, and also there was um, something that I think was part of our review that um, if district of choice were to um, be uh, renewed by the um, state legislature, and we chose to uh, remain a district of choice district, we would have to have a new timeline, correct, for the, for the. Yes, given the, given number two in the next steps, uh, because we are uncertain as to whether or not DOC will be renewed, it doesn't seem fair um, to have families submit applications in the September 1 to November 30th timeline when we may be, you may be exiting DOC. Right. So in the event that you um, aren't exiting DOC, then Ms. Madrigal would de develop a new timeline that would hold an application window, for example, November 1 to January 15. Okay. And then the process that we've used over the course of the last number of years would be then spread out between January to June instead of November to June. Okay. Okay. That's, that's help, definitely helpful. Thank you very much. And, and we're going to make sure that that information goes out to um, our, our district of choice families um, in some form. Right. Yes, so it, certainly it would be posted on the district website uh, and uh, DOC families would be notified as well. Okay. Okay. Can I just say that, you know, I'm looking at the um, slide three, the enrollment proje projection and looking at 28 through 29. And I know, you know, while we are trying to solve this problem within the district and the board, I look at this as a, a bigger issue with the town and have we had a conversation with the town council about, <clears throat> um, we have, a, no, 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 no. oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, we've been talking about, cheering you on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we've been talking about um, affor improving affordable housing and more housing, but also about trying to lure more people and uh, diversify business in our community. I take a look at Main Street and I see 
you know, over 10 businesses closed. And while I say this because I don't think this is just a problem that the district needs to solve because we it will not get solved that way. This is a town issue uh, as well. And I think that this town, we need to work with the town council and the community and make some start to make some changes. And I know that's going to be really hard while people are leaving California. But um, and I know the, the primary business has been here, you know, what it is for for a very, very long time. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking with COVID and with more businesses and more people working from home and Zoom, this could be a town and a place that can bring in more business and diversify business. And um, I just think about all of those moving parts to bring more people to want to live here, thus putting more children into our schools. So, yeah, I don't know, point. just some food for thought about how if we can partner with the town council and, and get them to help us to try to get more families into St. Helena, um, how can the district uh, be more appealing to families in the community that put their kids in private schools? Um, have we talked about that? Have we looked at that? You know, how, you know, what else we need to get creative because we need more kids in our schools. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with um, trustee. Simon, I think ultimately the piece is the housing piece because I think that, and as mentioned, as uh, President Pelosi, we've heard that for, a, I mean, people that have been here for a long time in St. Lena, it's always that they're going to do projects or increase housing, but really it hasn't happened. So I think that that's another piece that really needs to be addressed is pr for providing, obviously, for new families, but also providing for families that are here and are struggling to basically stay here, um, whether it's renting or, or wanting to buy here. So I, I think that that's something definitely that would be meaningful to, to maybe work with the council to kind of see what, I mean, because again, it's not just a district that's going to come up with these solutions, but like we always have, we work in partnerships, I think, in, in tandem to really promote that we need housing to, to a certain extent. And I agree with that where it's just like where it's, you know, maybe at some point we're able to as a, as a, the uh, board of trustees advocate for, for more, you know, show these numbers and say, this is where we're at, you know, and advocate for more affordable homes. I mean, cause I think a lot of it is, is just where families just can't afford to get in here. The, the younger families, cause it's just, it's too expensive. It's very expensive as we know. Um, and so, yes, so that, and then also I have a question, Andy, as far as, um, so the district of choice, so if they, if they do end, if the CDE did, does decide to end, um, district of choice, and maybe this was already asked and I apologize, um, is there going to be, do you think that they're going to put parameters around kind of what is going to happen with this, the students that are in the dis district of choice program now, whether we can keep them on or you know I mean is there going to be parameters and in, in how they close it how they how they sunset it I imagine they will make some recommendations I don't know if they'll if those will be requirements uh, we really haven't heard anything yet okay. about what that might look like from CDE okay okay thank you thank you and I'm thinking as well as about the you know the communication piece and the piece and the outreach that we as a board can do we talked about when we're gonna, part of our communication plan that we talked about was doing that, it's a wrap after every board meeting. You know, that's maybe a perfect opportunity to do some kind of written piece about that that gets distributed to people as well. That says, you know, this is, doesn't have to obviously contain this entire uh, presentation, but it would show the slide of this is what's happening. That's just one, I'm just thinking of ways to, of outreach and communication. Um, you know, I mean, you're right. It's, is it showing up to a council meeting and, and making, you know, getting on their agenda to say, this is what's happening and we, we need help kind of thing. So, um, those are things we can, you know, we can think about and figure out some ways to how we can do that because it is, it's a bigger issue than the people sitting here. Yeah. So, um, one other aspect in our um, in our two previous um, uh, surveys, um, we did look at um, the um, 
the student population in private schools. Uh, since, um, since I've been on the board, we've seen two private schools close in St. Helena, the Young School and um, the Catholic School, the St. Helena Catholic School. Um, we have seen the growth of the Montessori School, but um, we're not really sure. Uh, it's, it's difficult to say, okay, I'll start with what the findings were from the previous reports were that the private school enrollment in St. Helena was pretty static, that, um, that it, there was not much change. There, there was always an urban legend that, that the private schools were pulling away our students but actually um, what the data showed is that um, private school enrollment had remained constant. It would be interesting to see where it is now because um, this urban legend is growing that, that, um, that more and more students are going to the Montessori school. Um, what I, there's also other legends or, or hearsay that, that um, many of those students are coming from Calistoga or coming from Howe Mountain or coming from outside of our district anyway. So, um, so we, it would be helpful, I think, when we have our study session to also have that picture of what is the private school role um, in, if possible, um, it, it, there could be a, maybe an appendix to the, to the, uh, the the enrollment studies, just because um, then we kind of have a better understanding, just information-wise, as to um, you know what the whole picture is. Yeah, and to include the private schools also in Napa and Sonoma too. I mean, when you're thinking about private schools, you're thinking about all yes, of yes, the, yes. the whole. Okay. Yeah. It's just, in, in, and we actually, we, yes, we do have some high school students that go to uh, yeah. private schools in Sonoma in our community. Yeah. So President Pelosi, if I could confirm with the next steps, uh, Ms. Matrigal, if you could go to the previous slide. Uh, staff will continue to monitor CDE. We will post on the district website that applications will not be accepted uh, and the current DOC families will be notified of, of that as well due to the sunshine of DOC. Next, Next slide, slide, Erica. Yeah. Uh, you will continue to work with staff on the board policy, uh, looking for the, the right timing, pending more information from CDE. And as always, we will continue to implement and communicate the new policies and procedures. That sounds great, yes, I thank you. And I, I mean, it's really, it's the only really ethical way to handle w with our current DOC families. We can't in good faith take any Correct. applications. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Stubbs, do you have any questions about next steps? I do not, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay, item 13C, review and consider approval of contracts over $25,000. Um, $25, uh, Mrs. Andy Stubbs. Thank you. We have three for the board to consider this evening. Uh, the first would be <laughs> with uh, school and college legal services, and this is our annual renewal of our agreement for legal services, and I'm pleased to report that we have uh, approximately $35,000 left on our retainer with school and college legal and so we'll be able to carry those over to next year and we still have an adequate budget uh, built into the 2022-23 budget in case we need to increase that but um, I'm real pleased that we've been able to contain those costs and then the next contract would be with Dell Technologies for some Chromebooks for the primary school. The primary school staff has determined that it's appropriate now at this juncture to move away from iPads and go to Chromebooks for all their students, which I think is an exciting transition, will help prepare them for um, moving into the elementary and middle school. And uh, we plan to use a variety of one-time 
funds to cover that expense uh, and then there may still be a small amount left that we'll have to charge the unrestricted general fund but we have that built into the budget and then finally this would be our renewal with up valley family centers and this one i want to talk about a little bit uh, especially um, uh, due to the pandemic there's just been a tremendous need to support students and staff with regard to mental health and we've had an ongoing partnership with the up valley family center uh, we've met with them this past spring and looked at needs and um, determined that we needed to increase the number of hours that we're offering next year to serve all of our students and then also increase the rates so that we can recruit um, and retain highly qualified counselors through Up Valley to support our students. And so all of that information, that detail is included in there, but this is resulting in a in, uh, significant increase from $160,000 budgeted this year to 207,460 for next year. So that is a big bump. However, we also do have quite a bit of one-time money that we can apply to, um, to this added expense. And so my plan is to use all available restricted funding first, and then any balance left over will be charged to the unrestricted general fund. And so we've included, we've built that into, once again, built that into the budget for 22-23. And so with that, I would ask the board to consider approving the three contracts over 25,000. Thank you. Is there any public comment uh, on this agenda item via in-person, Zoom or written? Okay, thank you. Trustees, any questions about this agenda item? Okay. Actually, as far as uh, legal services, um, I, I am just curious because we are looking at um, our last agenda item, uh, looking at possibly devising a new um, uh, out of district enrollment um, uh, policy. Uh, policy and using their services. I mean, I, I, I have no idea how, how much time, legal time would we need because it might in my mind, it might be a time-consuming um, uh, idea, or we have really no way of knowing that. But what we have in in the retainer is probably enough. I am hoping. Well, it's <laughs> it's if I may. It, it, it's my view that what we have with the retainer plus the uh, budgetary cushion that I've built in for legal services should be ample to cover that and our additional legal costs. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Point well I've taken, just seen though. their bills sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions, trustees? No. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the contracts over $25,000 as presented? I'll make that motion. Macy, would you like to cast a vote? Aye. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. As most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson will conduct a roll call vote. Yes, Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Haug. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Elgin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye. Motion carries. Item 14A um, is our June board meeting. Um, uh, future agenda items. Erica has once again spaced them a little bit bigger, so. <laughs> um, uh, trustees, any subjects for uh, a future agenda item? I'd like to continue to discuss the math detracting um, conversation that we had today, especially with all of the the public input we had during open comment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and that's fine. I want to kind of gauge a pulse of everybody because, as you know, we need to have at least three trustees in agreement to mm -hmm. put that on and then provide staff with direction. Of course. So um, uh, are there other trustees who would like to support that with Trustee Simon, and if so, please say so now. Um, I'm, I know I'm not a trustee, but do yeah. I still have? Um, I, I totally think it's something we should continue talking about. Um, I'm personally in favor of it. Um, and I know I'll be leaving the high school, but I think it's something important for us to consider going forward, having right. friends and siblings in the district. Thank you, Macy. Trustees? I I would support that as well, just because I think that there's a lot of, um, there's still a lot of conversation that still needs to be had about it, I think. I think that there's there, there's still a lot of unknowns 
Um, with we saw that with the parents, right? This evening. I I would also um, be in favor of um, having a forum for um, community and parent and student input um, as far as a, an agenda item, uh, because um, we just can't have the discussion um, when it it is in during public comment on items not on the agenda. So I think that um, our community has shown that they want us to discuss it more. Okay, um, uh, Julia, anything to say or? Okay. I think, I mean, just with the piece of the public and having parents feeling like they didn't know about it, I think it, it warrants the opportunity to discuss it more further. Okay. So let me just see if I can recap this correctly. So it looks like the support is there for, uh, on behalf of the board, the majority of the board, um, to revisit this topic. Um, we obviously, at a board meeting, we're not gonna be able to engage in a conversation with the public and feedback. So if we have to be a little bit more specific in what we want to see here at this dais for uh, a future board meeting. and. It, we need to kind of hone in a little bit. Uh, it's gonna probably be up to the school sites to somehow uh, get in for, I would imagine it's gonna be on site administration to hold some kind of parent math meeting, Dr. Wilson. Mr. Heller, can you discuss the steps that have been taken this year to inform the community about this process? The, the next steps were to uh, connect with the fifth grade parents that were matriculating in the sixth grade to contact them and ensure that they were aware of, of the change in practice. I believe we had five to six, right? Yeah, okay. So we had five to six families that were affected in this particular year, and Corinne has reached out and, and spoken with them directly. Um, we are open to continuing the conversation. Um, I, you know, at this point, we have one grade level that's uh, affected, and I guess you would say between fifth and sixth. Uh, all the other grade levels will continue to matriculate as they have been. So we are just in one particular year where, you know, if we just looked at this one year in, in particular, where we have five to six students that are, um, you know, going to be uh, included in the sixth grade standard class, I believe, as. Um, was indicated by a, a parent who provided a response that they were in agreement with that. Um, we could continue the conversation. It's just hard this time of year because we have three weeks left of school sure. to get something together to have, um, you know, and, and I, I don't know all the plans, so I, I, I don't want to get bound into like guaranteeing a date or a time, but we'll do the best we can to further those conversations, whether it's at uh, individual school sites or if we just have a big um, meeting in, in this room or, um, you know, a like room to, to have uh, members of our math alignment committee and um, interested parents to further that conversation. So we'll, we'll see what we can do to, to make those things happen. Mr. Heller, um, what I just heard you say is that there are five or six students that are impacted that will be going into the sixth grade and be in a classroom where differentiation will occur so that they will have the, the work they will have challenging work. That is the yeah, commitment that, to- Yeah, that okay. that's been the plan, yes. So uh, board members, I might recommend that you consider pr bringing this item back. We can bring the, the presentation that was shown um, a couple of months ago, um, have it again as another information item to gain more um, knowledge and support. And, and moving forward, move forward with those sixth graders in that differentiated classroom and, and as Mr. Heller suggested, use part of next year for further discussion as to what, what steps would be taken following. He, Mr. Heller is correct. You know, yeah, there's just a little bit of time left here. And, and this has been an item of discussion for quite a few months. Um, and uh, so that would be a way to move forward and slow down at the same time. Right. I think that probably, I, I'm not speaking, I mean, if I was kind of reading the room, what I'm sensing though, Dr. Wilson, was there seemed to be a fair amount of parents who felt like they didn't know anything about it, that it was coming down the pipe. I'm not saying that's yes, true or not. So 
I, you know, I, I, I don't know how to address that. And I want to make sure that, I mean, we're, we're meetings held at campuses to say that this is what's happening to math. I mean, I, I, I'm throwing out that hypothetically, but that was a sense I got tonight was that a lot of people felt like they had no idea it was happening. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, and yes, we did have that. Um, and I think there was a misconception that the board voted on something. It was just a presentation that we were given. We don't create curriculum. So, um, I, you know, I just, I want to be mindful of what the parents are feeling out there. So I think uh, maybe, maybe it would be helpful to have some kind of feeling for those parents that they know what accelerated math is going to look like specifically at the elementary school, at the RLS, and at the high school. I mean, and, and maybe it exists. I'm just playing devil's just from where I'm sitting. So that way, if it's just differentiation, well, okay, but maybe, they, maybe they're looking for a little more. I don't know. Um, and that's why I think maybe we might need to flush that out a little bit more. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, okay. I, I understand what I understand what you're asking, and um, I I don't want to put our principals on the spot and bind them. So I do want to have a conversation sure. and see how we can make that happen. Um, right. I, I believe in the next two weeks it's possible, and so I I just want to kind of uh, entertain how those logistics would look. Sure. And I realize this yeah. is not a simple, I, I, I think we all realize this is not a simple ask. Um, but I do feel like there is, there are voices growing on this issue and it would be great to perhaps get a little bit more ahead of it so that we can give parents the information they're looking for. That's my sense. Um, I don't know if I'm spot on or not. <laughs> well, and I, you know, and I also, I, what I heard um, several times was I think that, in the, and this is very fair as well to our teachers, is like, you know, that puts right. a lot of lot, a lot of uh, burden on our on our on our professionals as well, our teachers as well, as far as the differentiation portion of it, you know, and and, and whether, <clears throat> and there's the question of whether. Are they ready for it? Are they trained for it? Or is it? It's got, what is it going to look like? Yeah, and that and that were that was a big component of the discussions we had in the math alignment committee to ensure that our teachers understood that that's going to be born upon them and within the classroom, especially in sixth grade, that there are going to be differentiated levels, and they've all accepted that and said, "We can do this. We're going to do this. What training do you need? We'll let you know." But I think we're prepared for it. So. I, you know, there was a there was a confidence that was exuded that this can be done, and so I, you know, based on that recommendation from the middle school staff and the high school staff, uh, in, including the elementary and primary, of course, that were a part of the committee, they felt it was the their ability was going to be able to differentiate within their classrooms. So uh, there wasn't a hesitation like, yeah, I don't I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. It, it was more of an acceptance of saying I, I can do that. I can do that. What I would like to see next month is to understand a little bit more from our administrators how the teachers are going to do it and how they feel confident that they're going to do that. I just, I mean, I, 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 I'm hearing and I'm believing you that they think they can do it, but I'd like to know how that's going to be monitored at the schools. How are teachers going to be, how are we going to make sure that the teachers say they can do it and that they are really doing it and that they're feeling supported in doing it because to teach to differentiate math you know three or four different levels in one class is is complicated and i don't know what training workshops they've had this year to really prepare them for august so i i would like to know a little bit bit more i mean if they feel ready to go now then it, can we see something next month at the meeting? I, yeah, if you'd oh, like yeah, to. Oh, yeah, that would be sure. great. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. You just I thought it would be easier just to let you know. Um, so the entire math differentiation thing came from the, not math differentiation, excuse me, the idea of switching the acceleration pattern, not removing acceleration by any means, but changing the order of acceleration and when that occurred 
um, came actually from the math teachers. They're the ones who came it through the math alignment committee and through a great deal of professional development and study and thought and reflection and years and years of data, which is what they have and what we have been using for multiple years. This was approached, we were approached by teachers um, feeling very strongly that this was the right move, also because it's the direction in which the state is um, expected to recommend beginning in July. And so all of those things, it's in alignment with best practices that are recommended. Teachers have had an enormous amount of training in how to differentiate. Um, Ms. Shear, who's our sixth grade math teacher, already has every single standard and every single lesson. She has the, the advanced lessons already set up for the year. So she's using a variety of um, materials to do that. One of the things she's using is within the textbook that we have, the Carnegie, Carnegie textbook, there are um, extensions in every single lesson. We've talked about it and she said, frankly, those are really good extensions, but our kids just going to want to do more math at a harder level. And she said some kids will and other kids are going to need something more engaging. And so she has all of the Joe Bowler um, materials that she has incorporated into the lessons that she's doing and those are super fun. They're, they're very high level thinking, uh, lots of critical thinking based on the same topic. So they're using the standard and then they already have it done for the year. Um, so the, the teachers do feel completely prepared and, and are actually, I would say, quite passionate about this. Um, we have contacted all of the parents of those students who, I have contacted all of the parents of those students who are affected. I do have a meeting next week um, with Sean and other parents should they choose to come. I have heard from one other parent and nobody else has contacted um, at all. So typically we don't reach out to the parents of students unless they um, would qualify potentially. Um, to move forward. We also have the fifth grade math orientation next week and this will be a topic obviously um, as part of the fifth grade math orientation is to go further into that I think there's a a word on the street that somehow um, Santa Elena Unified School District is eliminating advanced math and that is completely inaccurate and absolutely not true as um, the parent of a highly advanced student myself. I, w no one is recommending that, certainly not me, certainly not the teachers. Um, it's a, a, an advancement that doesn't cause kids to skip um, a year of foundational math, especially after two years of interrupted learning um, when they've already missed so much foundational math. So that that's how the teachers felt about it. Did, did you have other questions that I didn't address? Oh, I, I appreciate you sharing yeah. that information. The accelerated um, math it, within the regular math classrooms at the middle school Will they be teacher led? Will they? I know there was concern with parents at the middle school where they're being put in the hallway with packets. We have what, never what done that like? ever. No, at not the, the middle RLS. school. Okay, that I'm will sorry. Never, no, I'm, I ever apologize. Happen. Not Let at me the be RLS. Completely clear. That will never happen. We have single subject math teachers. Okay. They are not multiple subject teachers. They have one subject. They are highly trained. They teach one subject. They are fully trained to differentiate. At no time has any student been sent out with a computer and said, figure it out on your own. That will never happen at RLS while I am there, or ever. Our teachers would never, that's just not a thing. I, I can't say that strongly enough and actually hurts my heart um, <laughs> that anyone would think that, that that is how our math teachers would choose to differentiate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any other questions? No, thank you, and I think something you just stated is what probably needs to be totally. on the megaphone. Right. St. Helena Unified is not getting rid of advanced math. Absolutely not. So, uh, that's, And there is a fifth grade orientation meeting next exactly, week. In but, addition to having reached out to all yeah. of those parents and explained that in, right. an, in an email letter and individually meeting with every parent who had sure. any questions. Madison Butts at the high school has also been holding meetings um, with parents who are interested right. because he's kind of the lead um, as the high school teacher, the high school calculus teacher. He's the one who really sees the end result of this mm -hmm. and has been pushing um, because the high school is seeing sure. those gaps take place once they get there. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I So part of my understanding was that, so I've been an accelerated since sixth grade. We did mm -hmm. six, seven, and then I skipped to eighth, pre-integrated, or no, sorry, integrated. Um, and 
as a student in the classroom with all these other kids who had the same track as me, um, we just, I feel, so what I've heard is that we are now accelerating starting your sophomore year of high school rather than in middle school. Is that correct? Is that accurate? Is that so the like, acceler so the acceleration continues through middle school within the classroom because those students are able to access more of the curriculum than just as than than more of your average student I would say just as we differentiate for students who struggle more the math teachers feel very confident that they can differentiate within the class for higher level students as they do in English classes as they do in science classes as they do in history classes as they do in PE, and every teacher does that in every single subject. That's what teachers do. Um, and then the idea is that when they get to high school, those students have that solid foundation of conceptual understanding that allows them to do the higher level critical thinking that is necessary to really understand abstract math, not just to do it in an algorithmic way, but to understand that fully and completely and to get the grades that they need to go to the university of their choice. So what our data shows is that many of those students who should be our highest achieving A students end up not getting A's. And right now when um, SAT tests and ACT tests are no longer uh, um, being looked at by a lot of universities, grades are everything. And we want to make sure that our highest achieving students get the grades that they need to go to the school that they need to go to and that they don't have holes in their understanding that might cause some of them to um, have gaps. And we have heard from students directly. Uh, Mr. Butts has quite a bit of, um, of quotes and evidence from students that he's spoken to. I can't address that because that's, you know, past what I see at RLS, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was in that calculus discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in calculus with Mr. Butts mm -hmm. and um, I could just say, based on what I know he posts the average grades, is that all of us in calculus are achieving at a high level, and that calculus is like yep. a very difficult subject. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> I can absolutely say that. Um, and I, I just feel that the acceleration, I'm sorry, I know this is a different agenda item completely, but um, acceleration has helped me feel successful as a student. I you know, math is my favorite subject. And I feel that even if math was a struggle for me, I would choose to take math because I like math. It doesn't necessarily mean because I have to get a good grade to go to college in math. Um, it's just because I enjoy it. Um, it just happens to be that I'm a math science person. I wanna major in math and science, but um, I don't think it's all about necessarily a grade or, you know, it's. I think it's just about a pure interest and in taking what you're interested in from the start. I'm not necessarily into history, so I'd rather take a math course than a history course. And I just think having those options available from middle school on, if you want to do that, I, I mean, I know it's not that easy. I'm just, I'm just a high schooler, but you know, I don't know. I just feel like it's important to have options. Um, and I know this isn't just a middle school issue, um, but that's just my, no, of course. And, Macy, and we just appreciate to be, your just voice. to be clear, Macy, though, um, this path does still allow seniors like you who are interested in math to take calculus. It's absolutely an option, and they get the additional um, GPA bump, which I mentioned because it keeps coming up in the high school discussions that people appreciate that. So they get a larger middle school bump, um, uh, two years of it, and still end up in calculus. So, you know, Mr. Butts is much more versed in in the beyond middle school part, so I don't want to sure, overstep that whole thing. I just wanted to answer the brief questions that I appreciate that, that thank you. you. Had. Yeah, anything else? That brought up one more question. <laughs> okay, I one more, because then then let's get some. We, okay, yeah, we, this is already right, because yeah, we, we need to kind of yeah. like, um, I, right. yeah. we wanna ask, I think so what. I, I'm just wondering, I might, want to withdraw my um, my position of putting it on as an agenda item but more of a a, a request to um, hold more uh, um, community forums for students and parents maybe that's the place where the discussion it, which it, I'm thinking that's maybe what it is because the board doesn't create curriculum it's not that's not really what we we hire people to do that um we entrust our teachers to implement that curriculum um 
and it's not that we don't want to be invested in that and certainly no, but you know, um, I, I do agree I, from what, that's what I was saying. What I, what I was hearing tonight is parents didn't feel, and, and you know, there's, there's more than just the 12 people that we heard from tonight. There are, there's the rumblings are brewing out there. So I, something's missing for their understanding that that's not connecting for them they, you know, we need to get rid of the myth that advanced math is not coming. So is it the board's place to do that? Or is it the school sites to do that? And I, you know, I, I'm kind of on the fence. I, Laura, I know that it's an important topic to bring back, mm -hmm. but um, it sounds like if anything, maybe it's Mr. Butts coming back with his presentation and just one more time showing how accelerated math students are going to be taught in the classroom with with students i mean maybe that's what needs to be presented to parents i i think we can manage that between sites and facilitate that uh, ben. does that sound reasonable i mean i don't I, I i think you know i know they've been open to having that further discussion those opportunities so i think we'll be able to manage that between rls and, and the high school right. i mean i think one more time it's a two-way street the parents that are that we've heard from, they're obviously seeking it out. They want the information, you know. And maybe, maybe it's, there's not any more than what we're hearing from. And but I think once if like if we offer it one more time, and if, if it's let the parents come to get the information. The information is also available on the website under yeah. the curriculum tab. Yeah. And, and so you know, just it is there. there I, there's I think that they probably there. want more interaction with their yeah, principals and fine. their math teachers. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm. That's my sense, Mr. Heller. I yeah. don't. I'm not perceived that I'm accurate, you know, by any means. But that's what I gathered from tonight. I believe by the eye contact I got, we can manage that at our <laughs> at our two okay. school sites All there, right. and we'll take care then. of it. And just to reiterate, the first meeting I have with fifth grade parents is next week. Okay, that they're they're not my students until <laughs> next year. I am meeting with the parents totally next week, that. and this is a a topic, of course, that will be right. part of that sure meeting so and all parents have been reached out to who were directly affected okay okay thank you and i think same thing for the high school is all i want to add and thank you very much everybody i know that that just to clarify <laughs> what you're asking um mr heller and the math staff to do is to bring the presentation back that was given two months ago yes march in march um, to um, restate and reshare the information to allow for additional questions on the part of, of you and potential community input. Yeah, and trustees, I think if, um, you know, have my recommendation is have your questions honed of what you're looking for, um, you know, and, and so that that will help be part of the promotion of the information and um, that for parents can can glean from that as well rather than having you know let's try and be specific for absolutely him. president Pelosi and it would be helpful as well if any of you have questions that you would like to submit to me prior to okay. so that um, mr. Butts and the math team could address them um, and be prepared okay thank you everybody for allowing us to get to a place where we could feel is everybody feeling comfortable with that just uh, one one last okay. caveat sure. is the last board meeting is after the school year so I I don't know okay I don't want to commit to having teachers to you know give a presentation after their okay contract year is up so that might be a challenge that it be may be principals it may be maybe may mr. Heller um, principal Sinto and principal Cox okay and maybe and we, we will do our part to get questions together okay okay thank you thank you everybody I, I appreciate your patience why we we chatted that out Okay, 15A adjournment. Um, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll make the motion to adjoin, adjourn tonight's meeting. Is there a second? I'll Can second. we have Macy give her last oh, preferential yeah. oh, vote? Yes. Oh, my Hold goodness. on, you want to gavel too? Macy, <laughs> please cast your preference. I'm, I make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> is there a second? I'll second. Okay, as most are in favor of the motion, Dr. Wilson, please conduct a roll call vote. Trustee Simon. Aye. Trustee Haug. Aye. Trustee Kerr. Aye. Trustee Olguin. Aye. President Pelosi. Aye. Motion carried. Meeting ended at 9.43 p.m. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance this evening.